we're going to call this to order and uh, thank you all for coming to our work session today for my first chairship. Uh, we're going to start with an invocation from Pastor Jeff Henderson from Harbor Community Church. Uh, please rise. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for just the opportunity to be here. I thank you to live, or for the opportunity to live in a place where we can come together and discuss. We thank you for the democracy that we have in this country and in this county. Father, I pray um, what we were called uh, to pray for in Jeremiah 29. Uh, we pray for the good and the prosperity of the city, not only to pray for it, but to seek it. And therefore, that reminds us that what we're doing here, what folks are doing here is important to you. And that's an encouragement that what is going on here matters to you. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless uh, this county, the city, or this area. Why? That you would bless it to be a blessing to others. Let us never think the blessing is simply for ourselves, to use upon ourselves, but to be a blessing to others. Lord, let us keep in mind those that are on the fringes. Hear the voices of the voiceless. Remember the forgotten and love even the enemy. Lord, in discussion of matters, we pray for a mutual understanding, a mutual listening that no one would leave without feeling and understanding that they've been heard. Lord, I pray uh, that the differences, in the differences, we would not assume the worst. We're very quick to not only believe that we are right, but to think that the other is stupid or sinister. Father, forgive us for that tendency. Enable us to see each other as made in your image, to be seen with dignity, honor, and respect. We ask that you let our county be known for its justice, its fairness, and even its love. Let it be collectively an example of how to discuss and disagree without dividing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please remain the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America, America and to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. All right, today we have two work sessions. Uh, the first one we're going to be talking about um, the Piney Point, and second we're going to be talking about the CIP, which is a carryover from Tuesday. Before we begin, uh, other chair, uh, Ba, wanted to, <laughs> wanted to speak for a moment. Yes, thank you. Sorry I was uh, a little late this morning. I had a class. And I had to switch cars. So I'm not going to tell you what I'm driving because maybe that might get a flat tire. Who knows? A uh, little humor this morning. Let me, uh, I, got, I got a statement I want to read. And no one has seen this. I wrote it last night. Commissioner Ball, can I have a point of order real quick? Um, after your statement, could we just, baseball terms, do once around the horn? Perhaps the clerk could time us at three minutes each? and then we could move on to the business of the day. I am, I am sure that that would be necessary, trust me. But if we could be timed to three minutes each, and then we have a lot of meat and potatoes issues to cover today. Does the clerk... Uh... Thank you, thank you, Vicki. All right, this really isn't, yes ma'am? You can time mine, it won't take three minutes, it doesn't matter. Thank you for asking that. This is not for the board. This is for the citizens of Manatee County and what all they're going through right now and the part that I've played in that as well as others. I want to apologize to all the residents who I have disappointed in any action that I've taken according to some news outlets. Let me say, first of all, I love Manatee County. I always have. I've always tried to do what was best for her, Manatee County as a whole. I will continue to do that as I always have. This is not a resignation comment, far from it. It does, however, hurt me to see our county being torn apart because of politics. However, 
this VIP list that we all hear about. Um, I think that's an interesting term and trust me, that's not what it was meant to be at all. And I think it'll be interesting to see how this email even got out in the first place because it had information on it that was not and should not have been shared. At any rate, to the people on the list, I apologize because some have been contacted by our newspaper here locally in reference to it. And that was wrong, that was wrong. But had I not sent the email to begin with, it wouldn't have happened. So I'm taking full responsibility for that email. It's my fault. I wrote it, sent it to our public safety director. And what happened to it after that, I have no idea, but I will find out. The citizens always should come first. That goes without saying. The citizens for every commissioner sitting in this room should always make sure that our citizens come first. No citizen should ever be discussed in a derogatory manner. We should respect all citizens. And I think all of us on this board maybe miss that mark from time to time. I know that I do. It is true that I sent the email to the public safety director because I wanted to make sure that certain people were on the list. I did. And what happened, uh, I did have a copy of the registry. I went through and there are almost 8,000 people on it. So I've missed some emails that people that were on it. That's my fault. I didn't perhaps check it as thoroughly as I should have. But at any rate, um, I did that. As for Mr. Jensen, I'm not going to speak for Mr. Jensen. He does know. Thank you for that, Mickey. <laughs> That's okay. I love you. Um, I did speak with him. He's very upset that his personal information was given by someone at this county. And I took full responsibility for that. Because had I not written the email to our public safety director, someone would not have given it to the Bradenton Herald. So it all starts with me. I'll take responsibility for that too. I'm good with it. I just wish that some privacy could have been given to some of the people that was on the list. So a couple that was on the list got a phone call from the media who had the email. They immediately called me very upset because they were called on a cell phone number that wasn't public. Now it is. I took full responsibility for that too. For my part and my misconceptions, I am truly sorry. I did not receive the vaccine. And I've been on the list since, God, since it was first started. I didn't get it. I even went around the office after I found out about all this yesterday going, for heaven's sakes, everybody look at my arms. You can tell I didn't get a shot. At any rate, I also, again, want to apologize to Governor DeSantis. And I don't do that because I feel that, you know, I put him in jeopardy because of Lakewood Ranch. I did exactly what he wanted. And I'm thankful for that. I am thankful and appreciate the governor that he brought 3,000 additional doses of vaccine to this county. It's 3,000 more than we would have had. Now I understand a lot of people are upset because it didn't go where they wanted it to go. Okay, I'm, I understand that. But at the same time, he wanted to have it in Lakewood Ranch because the majority 
of the population are elderly. He's doing that all over the state. There was nothing special about Lakewood Ranch other than he wanted to help Manatee County as a whole. I stand by the governor and appreciate him more and more. Last night, he was actually on Fox News. I was so embarrassed that Manatee County was brought up. Lakewood Ranch was brought up in that interview. If any commissioner sitting here isn't embarrassed that that happened, then you've got an issue that is far more than wanting to serve the people of Manatee County because they didn't deserve that. The people didn't. Have I been upset over this? Yes. Do I feel terrible about this, as it's called, VIP list, which it wasn't a VIP list? Yes, I do. But I stand by our governor. I thank him from the bottom of my heart for bringing in the vaccines that he did. And I just hope that he'll do it again. And if he does, I can assure you, I will do exactly what I did this time. I'll try to get the people in Manatee County in the area that he feels is important vaccinated. You see, for me, this isn't about me. This isn't about politics to me. It's about a pandemic that is going on in our county, in our state, around the world. And if I can save and, and be a part of saving one life, then it's worth it. So people get out of politics and let's serve our citizens because that's what they deserve. And I think we're missing the boat. And I say we, I'm included in that. Everybody wanted to say, oh my gosh, you know, you said you picked out the zip codes. I take full responsibility for it all. I'm not trying to blame anybody else. Nobody else is to blame. But is it really about blaming somebody because 3,000 vaccines were brought to this county? I, you know, I guess to some, depending on your political party, it might be, I guess, seems to be. But for me, I'm proud that our governor thought enough of Manatee County to do that. And every one of you should feel the same. Thank the governor for doing what he did. Don't condemn him. Thank you, that's all I have to say. We'll start, we'll start on this side. It is off. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Servia. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. I wanna start by saying, um, as I've said many times in the public, thank you to Governor DeSantis for bringing the pop-up clinic to Manatee County. I have publicly thanked him every time I have spoken to the media because I am proud that he did that. Um, the only rub I have is that the district commissioner chose the winners and the losers, who would get the vaccine and who wouldn't. I don't think our governor knew about that. I, I think he was blindsided and talk about unfair. That was unfair. I do give Vanessa Ball credit for apologizing. I thank her very much for doing that. Um, taking responsibility for your actions is very important to me. And as for a VIP list, the only VIP list we have is every citizen that's 65 years or older. They're all on the VIP list. There should not be any other VIP list. I thank her for not taking the shot. I think that was a good move. I've got a 93 year old aunt who hasn't had a shot yet. I know Carol hasn't had a shot yet. I know, I know hundreds of people I hear from all the time who think they should get a shot first. So it's the golden ticket, right? Everybody wants a shot and there aren't enough vaccines. And that's why we're seeing so many of these problems. Um, as for being embarrassed, yeah, this situation though, you have to remember was created entirely by Chairman Baugh. She just admitted it. She's the one 
that chose the zip codes that the preferential treatment would be given to. This wasn't created by me or you or you or the audience. We're living through it though. Um, I will let you know, since we're all discussing how our night went, that I had a PAC, the Concerned Citizens PAC, who's not registered as a PAC yet, so maybe they're not officially a PAC, they should be by law, send out, I don't know how many thousands of emails to voters twisting the truth, saying I didn't support the governor, uh, misquoting the governor saying he responded to me. It was filled with untruths and it was done to try and persuade the voters that I was aligned with Joe Biden and Nikki Freed and I was a liberal. How embarrassing is that? I am a Republican. I'm not aligned with anybody but the citizens of our county. And this is not about politics. This is not about being Republican or Democrat. This is about what's right and what's wrong. And yeah, I'm upset about it. I didn't create it. We all have to live with it. Those are my comments. Mr. Whitmore. Mr. Chair. Um, well, I was part of that mailing list too. I, we, we figured maybe 150 people sent us emails last night and I responded to every one of them. Um, and other commissioners up here, Republican commissioners, because it went out to Republicans, criticized what happened, but for some weird reason, they weren't on that list. Um, so uh, it, is, it was a pact doing this. And uh, actually, I had more than I thought respond after they did research, apologize. So I was up to about midnight, and then I was up at 5.30 this morning continuing on to give um, our citizens the facts. This is a worldwide pandemic. This is a nationwide, this is Florida. What we saw this week was a lack of judgment from our chair. Um, I, and there's the press is here, can attest, and I've told this um, one citizen can attest that every interview I did, I thanked the governor and Lakewood Ranch. I never thought, I, th I th actually thought he was kind of ambushed because I, I was hoping that somebody would have warned him what was going on before he got up there because he got unnecessary heat because of us. Um, I, uh, the intent on that list was to get shots. And Commissioner Baugh, I have still have yet to see the list and maybe somebody here can give me a copy of it since I'm one of the commissioners, I would like to see it. The intent of that list was to get shots and Commissioner Baugh was on it. So there's no, and the reason why I don't think she got the vaccines because in the past she's told me she wasn't going to get them. She was nervous. She won't even wear a mask. Uh, we didn't have our group pictures the other day because some won't wear a mask up here. So, um, you know, I'm glad she didn't take it. But when I sat here Tuesday and told you all that I've actually been giving vaccines and I've been working there volunteering for the last two weeks, for her not to say, well, I've got an appointment, you know, not even to say that. So, but she has taken full credit for what she did and I appreciate that Vanessa has never wanted to back away from the hard issues. But I just want you to know that uh, the intent was to get the vaccine and it wasn't fair to the citizens of Manatee County. And for those that are sending this information around the, about the PAC, I hope that people find out who this really is. This literally came out about 5.30 or 6 last night, the PAC information. And it um, kept up this morning, and I'm sure it's not done, but they've sent it to thousands. It's not true. Um, I, I contacted Bill Galvano this morning so that I can get the message up to the governor, because actually it was just Misty and I that were the two targeted, that that information that went in that pack was 100% false. That's all I have to say. Mr. Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, uh, the VIP list, uh, obviously, and that's what the media is calling it. Um, but that list, uh, I have no, I'm not trying to defend that at all. Um, that was a misjudgment and has already been um, owned up to by the chair. Uh, beyond that, to sit here and say that we're surprised that the governor, that, that people tried to embarrass the governor. Um, I don't believe that at all. I think that was all part of the plan yesterday in the meeting. Um, I said that out loud, that we ran the risk if we kept being so uh, petty 
that we ran the risk of him not coming back and not wanting to have anything to do with Manatee County. Um, and here we are two days later, and that looks to be the situation we're in. Um, but it wasn't without warning. It wasn't an accident. Uh, it was purposeful, I believe, to score points with uh, the Democrat side, or maybe not. Regardless, I think it was a sore misjudgment. I think it does a disservice to our citizens. I think it ignores previous policy here in the county um, through MCR Health that has taken from the allotment that comes to Manatee County and distributed those in geographical areas on purpose without any objection from anyone up here because we saw the need to get shots in arms and get people safe or at least feeling safe uh, from having the vaccine. Um, all of a sudden, when a conservative governor shows up who's done an excellent job of leading this state and even on a national level shows up, we're concerned about something that has to do with geography. Um, could everything have been done perfectly in the decision-making process of 48 hours or could it have been done better? I'm sure it could have. Um, but to pretend like this is a surprise, I specifically warned, I said, we run the risk of making the governor not want to be a part of our community. And, uh, you know, right now on a public group on Facebook that is, uh, that's very popular in my area, you know, you've got 85 comments, or no, over 100 comments, I believe, and 85 likes, and the, the it says DeSantis threatens to, or no, this is what he says, <laughs> he says, Hope this makes all the Karens happy when they complained about this yesterday, exclamation. I don't know this person said this. Hope this makes all the Karens happy when they complained about this yesterday. DeSantis threatens to pull vaccines from Manatee County after residents question site placement. Um, you know, it's, it stinks when we run into something and we don't see it coming, uh, when we're surprised, when we're trapped. But this wasn't a trap. This wasn't a surprise. It was obvious that if we criticize... Uh, what should have been no big deal and has been no big deal when it happened in the villages, when it happened in Sarasota, uh, when it happened in all these other communities, uh, I think is uh, I think is not a good reflection on Manatee County. That's okay. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. You are a friend and I love you, um, but I think you've made a, a terrible mistake here. Uh, I think Commissioner Whitmore is right. It's a lack of judgment. Um, I am, however, glad to hear you take responsibility and apologize. I'm appreciative of that. You know, I was not 100% sold on the random lottery system when it was first adopted. Uh, I understood that it was in part because the website couldn't handle the amount of web traffic, uh, but it was the direction that the board chose to go. We, you know, in unison, we all in, a, in agreement on that. We were seven to zero to move forward with that system. So I bought in and I fully supported the lottery system. Uh, the reason is because um, the reason that I've been assuring residents, I've been running around telling residents of district three, that is a fair system and that we're all on an equal playing field. Uh, however, what happened over the last few days undermines everything I've been telling my residents. Uh, favoritism was shown and that erodes people's trust in their government. I certainly hope that this does not affect Manatee County's ability to participate in future pop-up vaccination, vaccination sites moving forward. Um, but that said, uh, I'm pretty sure that we are all in unison here at this point, you know, we're all in agreement that we're going to stick with the, we can't take a vote obviously, but I think that we're all in agreement that we are going to stick with the random lottery system moving forward and not deviate from that in any way, shape or form. Um, and uh, this sort of thing will not happen again. Um, and if we're not, hopefully someone will speak up, but I'm, I'm assuming that's where we're going from this point. And I apologize to all the citizens that uh, this was allowed to happen and I assure them it will not happen again. Thank you. I'm probably the last one that try to take shots at people. I always look for opportunities for us to um, come together and best serve our, um, our community. I'm very thankful from the governor and your efforts. 
because we got 3,000 more um, vaccines. Um, <clears throat> my concern now is what are our next steps um, to make sure we have strength in supporting our lottery system. Um, I did call a couple of people last night and apologize to them because I was embarrassed um, because I believed in our lottery system when the IT guy spoke, um, Mr. Paul, I can't think of his last name, and Jake spoke about the, the integrity potential of the lottery system potentially being compromised. Um, they assured me that it could not be. However, um, it was. And with all of the, the media and, and people twisting and things like that, which is why I really try not to do a lot of comment. I'm looking for ways for we can progress and move forward. But I will say this right here. Way I was brought up, you know, someone taught me this when I was in, when I was in college. It's it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And um, I'm thankful that um, our chairman identified that this could have been done a little bit differently. And I'm thankful that she took full responsibility. And I think as we uh, move forward, I think it's our intent for us to have a more inclusive approach. And instead of having a highlight of exclusivity and we're in a situation where we are right now. It doesn't matter what any of you do or any of you all say toward me, toward being a Democrat or anything like that. I know who I am as far as being Reggie Bellamy. And I love you too. And my intent is to be the best individual that I can be. Um, regardless of the slants as far as people talking about parties and everything like that, how about you give all of us an opportunity to be public servants? And I think that challenge is something that should be extended across our country as far as our oath and far as us having an opportunity to serve people the best that we possibly can. It's easy, it's real easy to flare up with anger. It's real easy to flare up with distrust and discouragement. The hard thing is to do is to be civil and focus on humility. My, 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 my intent is, is not to go, you know, taking, you know, daggers at people. And one of the statements that I made, you know, if someone did do something like this, I would not have done that. You know, the way I was raised, the way I was brought up, you know, let a man judge himself. I constantly look at Reggie and try to make sure Reggie is the best that he can be. In a situation like this, all of us need to examine ourselves. What could we have done differently? What could we have done better? Because we still have 410,000 people out there that trust for us to be public service and leaders and count on us to perform the best that we can so we can make our accounting the best we can. Thank you, Commissioner Ball, for your efforts and for your apology. You know what? In the reality of this, somebody's still going to twist it. Somebody's still going to turn it around and what I'm saying or what Kevin is saying, and they're still going to make it the worst that it can be so they can get their ratings up and they can sell newspapers, which is why I say, nope, I'm not commenting. I'm not getting into it. We're here to talk about Piney Point and Capital Improvement Plan. How about we start that? I 100% agree, so I'm going to keep this quick because I think everyone's kind of said everything. And I somehow ended up on like a 10-minute press conference yesterday, so I think I said, <laughs> what, yeah. what, I think I pretty much said what I need to say. But no, I mean we keep talking about optics, but it's 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 not optics; it's reality. Um, this was this is poorly done in my mind. Uh, we've got a lottery system. I, I've spent countless hours telling everyone it's a legitimate system. To make an argument that 3,000 Lincoln Ranch people is positive because it's 3,000 less people, well, like I said yesterday. 
3,000 people over the age of 80 was also 3,000 people off the list. 3,000 people in Rabonia and Palmetto and places that have a little bit harder time getting online or, or getting transportation is also 3,000 people. So to use that narrative that 3,000 is, is beneficial to everyone is, is kind of missing the, the bigger picture from that standpoint. Um, I think the bigger thing we need to focus on is, is the future, not the past. You know, like I said, uh, what's done is done at this point. There's 3,000 people that were called, nobody in the media. I asked them if they were willing to do it for me. We're, we're willing to call those 3,000 people and tell them we changed our mind and they're losing their vaccinations. Uh, once the calls are made, you know, people are already are gearing up to get their vaccinations. It's unfortunate that they were called. It's unfortunate the system that we put in place to have them called. But it, it was what it was at that point in time. But, you know, we can learn from from our mistakes. And, you know, I don't think anyone up here, any of the seven of us should unilaterally have control over 3,000 vaccinations. Um, if we can have an emergency meeting in 24 hours for a curfew, we can have some sort of a meeting to discuss how we handle pop-ups. Uh, better yet, we can discuss this on Tuesday or whenever we, we have a voting right and make a, a, a decision now so the people of Manatee County know it. My recommendation is we've got a lottery system, so just 3,000 more in the lottery system. I, I, and if we're going to self-select, I, I would recommend starting on the older population and working your way down and we start chipping away at that, that top level, uh, which are higher risk. If we're going to self-select, I don't think it's necessary, but that would be my recommendation. So, you know, let, let's acknowledge the mistakes from the, the past couple of days, but, but focus on how we can reassure people of Manatee County that, you know, these mistakes are not going to be made again. This board does, in fact, care about our lottery, care about everybody in Manatee County equally and, you know, move forward. That's it. Madam Chairman, members of the board, I just have a quick update. Um, thank you for talking about this. Um, I know we would like to move on to your um, topics when you're ready, but I do want to inform you that we did get a call this morning around 830 that 200 more Vaccines were being sent to the Lakewood Ranch um, site, and we are doing a random pull from your pool to add 200 more names. So I really just wanted you all to know that before you finished your discussion. So thank you. I, I know you're not. No, I just wanted to know the name, Paul Alexander. I couldn't think of Paul's mm -hmm. last name. So I, I don't like leaving people out there, you know, and he did a great job. Yeah, and I, I want to make sure I called Jake Sauer's name. Paul Alexander, that's the individual. Yeah. Just real quick, uh, the governor's order still stands. It's 65 and older. So even if we wanted to do the 85s, we can't because the order hasn't changed yet. We're still under the state of emergency. It's 65 and older. We can't discriminate. I mean, I know I'm 100% positive. Am I correct? The current order is still yeah, in place. Six, well, you had mentioned let's do the 85s, but we can't. We have to still do 65 and older until the governor changes it. That, that's his order. I was going to, my point was solely not let's move our entire lottery to 80 plus or 85. It was, if we have the ability to pull 3000 names out of a hat from wherever zip code, we feel like it, then I think we can pull whatever we want out of there. We've proven we can dissect this thing and put this thing together. I, I get what you're saying, but that was the argument. My, my full argument was let's leave it in the lottery. All I said was if we're freewheeling here and pulling 3000 names out of a hat based on various lists, then we can pull them out of whatever list we want. That's all I was saying. Madam Chairman. Really? Yes. yes well, you, you did allow others to speak. Is That's it all right that I speak to? I just want to thank everyone for their comments. I really do. And Commissioner Baugh, to you, you are my friend. I can disagree with what you have done. And I've always said this, never take things personally. And I don't hold a grudge against anyone. So let's move forward as a board of seven and do the business of this county. That's what we need to do. I thank you all very much for your comments. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Uh, the only thing that I would say, if anyone really thinks I would do something without the governor knowing it and him coming, uh, y'all are crazy. Uh, for thinking that, I can assure you. But at any rate, uh, the governor, just to touch base on this, because I know the press has been on this this morning. Uh, it was a, a big to-do that Governor DeSantis was going to be in Pinellas this morning at 9 o'clock for a news conference, and everyone automatically assumed it would be about Lakewood Ranch, but it isn't. It's about a gentleman, a veteran, who received, I think, this 2,000th 
uh, vaccine. And the governor was there to, to see that happen. So again, um, very proud of our governor. Um, I'm sure there'll be more that Commissioner Bellamy, I really do appreciate your comments. Um, you know, I, I will tell you, honestly, it, when it does come to you, party is never an issue. I mean, it, it's just not. It, that's how you are. And, and I've always appreciated that. Thank you. It's, it's much better than to have, you know, some say they're one thing and really be another. So I appreciate it. Uh, Madam, nobody in this room was meant by that comment, Commissioner Serbia. Uh, Madam Administrator, would you like to carry us into our... Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, members of the board and for um, those that are here this morning. We have a work session that we will be moving on into um, first Piney Point. I would like to read changes to the agenda for the record. Under this item two, which is Piney Point Emergency Water Treatment Project, the last bullet point under your background discussion was updated to include an outline of the staff's presentation of the item. And then also the following attachments were added. One, the board's motion on February 4th, 2021. Two, an injection well presentation. Three, a memorandum from Tampa Bay Nitrogen Management Consortium. Four, the FY21-22 Piney Point Appropriations request to the Florida House of Representatives and five public comments. These were added based on uh, individual briefings with board members and requests for information from board members to be provided at this morning's discussion. Additionally, later in the meeting, we have an agenda item on the FY22 Capital Improvement Plan, and this particular item was continued from your February 16th work session. So a couple housekeeping items. We're going to start to institute a break in between um, the morning session and so at 10.30, we'd like consideration for a hard break for just about 10 minutes so that the clerk and the remainder of the board can um, take one moment to um, leave, come back, and then continue your topic. And then at 12 noon, um, we ask for just a 30-minute break for um, the lunch period if you're still in your discussion of the capital improvement plan. 10.30, please, for a hard break. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's all the updates. Thank you. All right. Charlie, you could thank you, Mr. Your Mr. Chairman, uh, County Attorney, members of the board. Uh, my name is Charlie Hunsaker. I'm the Director of Parks and Natural Resources within Manatee County. And as the County Administrator Sherry has indicated, um, our scheduled presentation today follows the outline, follows the outline in your presentation in your presentation materials. I wanted to open by reciting actually the motion that was made at the commission meeting on February 4th. I'll just say this by verbatim. A motion was made by Commissioner Servia to have a future agenda item, work session or written explanation discussing the final costs and the risk and benefits of both scenarios, cleaning the water and releasing into Bishop Harbor and deep well injection. Motion was seconded by Commissioner Van Osterbridge and adopted. So within the time allotted, uh, staff has prepared assessments of technology for deep well and a refresh on the nitrogen consortium uh, procedures and policies for, for, for Lower Tampa Bay for which Manatee County is a member. So I would like to uh, turn the presentation over uh, for technology discussion to Jeff Goodwin, Deputy Director of Manatee County Utility System. Thank you, Charlie. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, Per the uh, motion that was made at the February 4th meeting that Mr. Hunsiger referenced, uh, utilities was charged with um, uh, coming forth today and bringing some information specifically on deep injection well technology as we are the managers of a deep injection well system within your utility. Um, to that end, we have engaged our deep injection well consultants to provide you a short PowerPoint presentation and hopefully layman's terms so that you can better understand that technology. Um, this is not utilities advocating for this technology as the solution at Piney Point. It's just offering up our resources and experience in that, um, in that area. Um, that said, um, we brought in Mr. Mark McNeil, the CEO of ASR Us, who's been, um, uh, been providing consulting services for us for over two decades now. And Mr. Pete Lark and his vice president um, are here to uh, to share their um, expertise. 
Uh, what they will not be able to speak to is um, the closure of the stacks. They will be able to tell you how this technology um, may be employed to empty the stacks and manage the seepage, the de decades long seepage and um, provide you details um, um, for that. But they won't be able to speak uh, speak beyond that as far as uh, how the, um, the site is actually closed. I would um, offer that, um, uh, that if you allow um, Mr. McNeil to get through his 15 slide presentation or so, uh, each one builds on itself. So it might be best to hold off on the questions until he's through. I think of many of the questions that you you all have expressed, he'll be able to um, answer uh, through his presentation. So with that said, Mr. McNeil, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Goodwin. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. It's it's truly an honor to be here to share a little bit of my world with you. Uh, I've lived in the greater Tampa Bay area here for, uh, uh, I guess, 36 years now, which is uh, my career. And uh, my entire career has been dedicated to the to the safe implementation of, of, of injection wells uh, across Florida. So um, with that, um, thank you again for the, for the invitation here. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, so injection wells in Florida, uh, there are over 17,000 injection wells uh, of various types, classifications and whatnot. Uh, we truly do count on uh, the underground injection control program here or injection wells as, as helping us manage a, a lot of our, our wastewaters and other source waters uh, that we don't want to see discharged into our, our, our very sensitive uh, surface water bodies here uh, statewide. Um, Many of these were grandfathered in. Uh, many of these are 100 years old, for example, over in Orlando when uh, lake level control wells after hurricanes would come through and devastate areas. Uh, they, they, they were drilling wells 100 years ago to help them with flood control and other things. These are all included in the injection well uh, classifications here. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk specifically about class one injection wells. Uh, class one injection wells are divided into two different types, uh, domestic wastewater, uh, which is something that Manatee County has a, a lot of experience with, and as many of your neighbors like St. Petersburg do. But uh, more specifically today, we're going to talk about the other type of class one injection well, and that is the industrial wastewater disposal wells. Uh, not as many of these uh, uh, statewide, uh, but certainly there's a, 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 a fair number of them. Uh, This is a, a, a map off of DEP's website. I apologize, it's 2003. That's the last time they've updated it. There's certainly a lot more uh, uh, dots on the map, uh, symbols on the map here. Uh, if we were to get DEP to update this um, uh, map right now, specifically the class one industrial wells, you might see the red uh, it, for those of you that uh, aren't colorblind, I apologize, but the, the red uh, uh, symbols here on the map are those class one industrial wells. Uh, and there's quite a few more uh, of those now installed uh, statewide here. Uh, I've got some numbers here. Uh, class one industrial injection wells, just so everybody knows, also include uh, wells that discharge uh, reverse osmosis concentrate. Uh, uh, those facilities that take brackish groundwater there's, it, it basically splits it into two streams, a drinking water supply, but then there's, there's a, a concentrate that goes back into the ground. That's also considered a class one or an industrial waste stream that has to go down uh, class one industrial wells. So total uh, in, in the state right now, there's 121 class one industrial wells uh, with 80, among 89 different facilities. Um, so maybe about one and a half uh, average injection wells per per class one facility. Uh, if we take out all the RO concentrate wells, uh, now we're down to true industrial, what, what you would look at as industrial waste wastewater probably. There's 22 different facilities in the state uh, um, and there's 38 injection wells. The closest one to you right now that's in operation is, is just in Southwest Polk County. Uh, well, I was involved with putting in, it's for the Tampa Electric Company's uh, Polk Power Station where they're going down and, and discharging uh, their industrial wastewater. Uh, there's in, uh, industrial injection wells currently being constructed in Hillsborough County, in Pasco County, 
uh, and, and many of the adjoining counties uh, around here. So it truly is something that we count on heavily statewide. Uh, this is not uh, uh, anything new uh, that the county might be considering. So we pulled this uh, off the EP's website uh, and just wanted to read it to everybody that the injection wells are required to be constructed, maintained and operated so that the injected fluid remains in the injection zone and the unapproved interchange of water between aquifers is prohibited. Class one injection wells are monitored so that if in uh, migration of injection fluids were to occur, it would be detected before reaching what we call an underground source of drinking water. And I'll get into that definition here uh, uh, shortly. But I thought that was a, a, a very nice summary about the safeguards that are in place there uh, 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 by the state. Uh, this is a uh, well cross section you're going to see a lot of. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the on the well construction itself right now on this slide. I really wanted to introduce this slide to tell you a little bit about the geology underlying the Piney Point area and, and really throughout uh, Manatee County as a whole. Uh, a couple definitions I'd like everybody to uh, uh, be made aware of up front here. And what is an aquifer? It's a geologic formation, group of formations, or part of a formation that is capable of yielding a significant amount of water to a well or to a spring. Uh, the confining zone is a geologic formation, group of formations or part of a formation that is capable of limiting fluid movement between aquifers. Total dissolved solids is a, a, uh, a very important uh, water quality uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, trait that we look at here. It's, it's uh, the concentration of dissolved minerals, essentially how salty is the water uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and, and specifically in this area, much of that salt content is sodium chloride, just like it is out in the Gulf. So it's seawater that we're, we're, we're really looking at here. Uh, and finally, the water quality does deteriorate uh, in most areas. As we get deeper, the, we go from a, a fresh water aquifer to a brackish aquifer to a saline aquifer. So you may hear me uh, use a few of those terms. Uh, uh, what we have is a, 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 a two primary aquifers uh, here in this area. We have the upper Florida aquifer or what you might see as the UFA uh, and the lower Florida aquifer. Uh, yellow and purple, again, uh, color uh, coded here. In between those two aquifer systems here, we have what's called the middle confining unit. This is a very important geologic formation here uh, uh, that, that we would, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, if you look on the desk that Pete's sitting at right here, that's a, a, a core that was taken out of Manatee County uh, through that middle confining unit. It's, it's very dense, it's, it's very, very impermeable. Water really can't pass through that. And we have about 300 feet of that separating the upper uh, Florida aquifer from the lower Florida aquifer. Uh, uh, you, you'll also see on this, uh, we've got fresh water here down to uh, uh, roughly 80 or 900 feet here in this area. And then it quickly goes uh, to a, a, an unusable water, a water that's not uh, considered to be an underground source of drinking water today or in the future. And finally down in the, the shaded green area here is uh, that water with TDS concentrations. It really is difficult to distinguish that water from, from seawater, it's, it's that salty. So that's just a, a brief overview of what, what underlies us uh, here in Manatee County. Um, this is a map showing the top of, uh, of where this middle confining unit uh, comes out. It's at about in the, Man in the Piney Point area here. It's at a depth of approximately 1600 feet is where we start getting into this very impermeable rock. And um, it's so significant that the confining properties here uh, uh, statewide are mapped. Uh, it, it's that contiguous across the, uh, the state of Florida, even into Georgia, South Carolina, such that we can map that and it, it, it separates the upper from the lower Florida aquifer. And then the top of the lower Florida, and so in other words, the bottom of this real impermeable zone, the bottom of our confinement there is 1900 feet. So again, about a 300 foot, think of that as about a 300 foot roof uh, made of that material that you'd had on your house. You'd probably feel pretty comfortable that uh, you're not gonna get rained on that day, I, I would imagine. Um, 
the also wanted to point out we've got we've shown a couple of arrows here uh thought that might uh, uh raise some questions i think i've heard at previous board meetings uh, you interested hey where does this water go there is a natural gradient to the south southwest uh, uh offshore here which uh, uh with no other uh, uh uh, stress is placed on it that the water would essentially just naturally migrate uh, very, very slowly feet per year um, offshore. So uh, very slow moving. These aren't underground rivers that we talk about. You may have heard it expressed like that, but this is a very, very slow moving system here. So regulatory requirements, uh, we have to construct these wells. It's, it's probably one of the most onerous, if not the most onerous uh, program. Uh, uh, the DEP uh, regulates. It's it's based on federal uh, national regulations uh, uh, that that have uh, evolved from the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act back in the uh, 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 mid to late 80s, even maybe even as early as the 70s. We were talking about it, um, but it's uh, the the regulations. If you if you're that type of person that really likes to dig into it, it's six, uh, 62 528 of the Florida Administrative Code. Um, we're we're limited with class one industrial injection wells to uh, an injection zone that contains greater than 10,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids. We cannot affect a zone uh, that is less than 10,000 milligrams per liter. If you have fluid move into that zone, you will be shut down. You cannot continue injection. And we've got safeguards in place to make sure that we detect that well above it, uh, that ever happening. Uh, we have to demonstrate confinement between our injection zone and the base and the 10,000 TDS uh, uh, interval there, uh, what we call the overlying underground source of drinking water. Uh, and finally, I think this is extremely important because of maybe some of the uh, um, uh, discussions in the past, but a class one injection well doesn't have a lot of water quality uh, uh, limitations, but we absolutely cannot inject any fluid that is characteristically hazardous. So if, if the Piney Point water was considered hazardous waste, we could not put this water down the well. There would have to be treatment and other safeguards in place to make sure that we, were, we are not putting anything hazardous down, down in the ground. And I thought that would be something you would appreciate hearing. So what is an underground source of drinking water? It's defined by DEP as groundwater with TDS concentrations less than 10,000 milligrams per liter. It's groundwater that can potentially be treated uh, versus uh, via this uh, reverse osmosis process membranes where they're trying, they, they basically pass water through and it takes out all the salt uh, for drinking water use. You can actually treat bay water, seawater, you know, seawater to drinking water standards, but it just becomes very energy intensive, very, very expensive. And so uh, the 10,000 TDS threshold is actually a very conservative threshold. Most people that are, I, I think Sarasota County uh, relies on this technology quite a bit. Uh, they're targeting Inglewood Water District I've been involved with since the mid 80s. They, they have had a very successful RO pro, uh, uh, treatment process. They're targeting three to 4,000 TDS. So think of this as probably really protecting groundwater that's twice as salty as that that is really being used uh, even with today's great technologies for, for drinking water supplies. Uh, our injection zone is going to have an uh, approximately 35,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids. That's, again, equivalent to seawater. And just as a point of reference, uh, all the drinking water that uh, uh, you hopefully are, are consuming, uh, the drinking water standard, this is, uh, is, is 500 milligrams per liter statewide standard. It's a secondary drinking water standard. Uh, the county, uh, Mr. Goodwin, if, uh, about two to 300 milligrams per yeah, so, so you're about half the uh, uh, drinking water standard uh, of, of what's allowable uh, uh, as a drinking water standard. So, so I promise you we'd be back to this figure. Uh, this is what the, uh, our, our uh, opinion would be as to what this injection well would look like. This is very similar to the injection well design that was uh, uh, submitted to DEP back in 2013 uh, on behalf of Manatee County and, th and then was pulled off the table in 2014 because of some questions. Uh, uh, but this is very similar uh, to that. Uh, as, you, as you'll notice from this uh, graph here, we're, we're setting casing down to about 1,950 feet. Uh, that may change plus or minus 50 feet. Every well is a, a, 
the geology, it wasn't a perfectly flat surface. Things could change. It could be 2000, it could be 1900, but you're, you're going to the base of this, this rock that contains uh, the impermeable strata in it. And, and then you've got an open hole down there that will be at least 3,000 feet, if not a little bit deeper. Most of the permeability is actually in the lower part of, of, of this open hole interval. Um, so again, you want to get through that area and then take advantage of the, the porous rock that's, that's down there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these safeguards uh, that, that we have in place to make sure that uh, any injection well constructed is constructed safely and operated safely and operated as designed in the future. Uh, we put in these multiple barriers, casings to protect the underground source of drinking water. Uh, we have a demonstration of confinement during the, the construction process to make sure that, that we truly do have a good ceiling, if you will, on the top of the injection zone. Uh, we do what's called mechanical integrity testing uh, on on regular basis to make sure that there aren't any leaks that are, are are developing in the in the well that that could potentially cause fluid migration. We have a monitoring system in place, and 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 very importantly, there's monthly operating reports that go into DEP. So there's a a real time look as to how the injection well system is performing. So let's talk about the first one, the casing material. We have telescope casings. And uh, using uh, carbon steel casing, uh, the last one has to be a half inch thick, so it's a very thick casing down to the top of the injection well. And then inside of that, there's one more safeguard. We actually have to the same depth, uh, this fiberglass reinforced uh, plastic here, uh, or what we call FRP. Um, it is a very thick material. It's a very inert material that is not uh, susceptible to any corrosion. It'll be here a thousand years from now. Uh, it's a very good material. Uh, we haven't seen since we started using these these type of uh, of, of liners in the wells and, and cementing these liners up to land surface. We haven't seen one of these uh, fail in the state. Not one has had to be replaced. So very, very good casing uh, or materials of construction that we use. While we're out here constructing, DEP requires uh, constant oversight uh, by a professional geologist uh, uh, putting these wells in. They want to make sure that it's it's put in. There are no shortcuts uh, that are be t being taken um, by the drillers. We do a lot of testing out here. We do what's called uh, uh, packer testing. Uh, here what we're doing is we've got essentially what you'll see uh, uh, here on the right is, is uh, we put these uh, Packers down there, you blow them up, think of them as like balloons. You're, you're isolating different areas that allows you to take water quality from a very specific zone, allows you to, to determine its water production capabilities, and most importantly, allows you to see that uh, we just can't pull water, the confining properties of, uh, of those areas that we were hoping to demonstrate confinement. We are uh, we take cores like the one on uh, Pete Larkin's uh, uh, desk here or table here. Uh, that's a process that we we collect those. We ship them off to a, a, a testing laboratory and and have them tested for uh, uh, different things like hydraulic conductivity, a few other terms that I won't bore you with with here today. But basically, the uh, we we understand all the properties of the rock and of that confining layer at that that point. Also geophysical logging, you might hear us talk about uh, uh, a geophysical logging. It's, it's, it's our eyes and ears. We can't physically get down there. I'm not scuba certified and nor would I want to scuba uh, down to 2,000 or 3,000 feet. But uh, the geophysical logging are different tools that we send down the hole that there are eyes and ears as to what we have down there, both in terms of the rock formation and in terms of the groundwater that is, is contained within those rock formations. They can get out, they can look into the rock. Uh, we have things uh, that send back uh, electronic signals here. This just happens to be a, 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 a picture of a video survey. We have to video survey the whole well, make sure everything was constructed properly, see what the rocks physically look like. Uh, but it's just one of uh, a number of tools uh, that we are required to run during the construction process. Uh, this is that laboratory testing of, of, of the cores here uh, where we send these into the, in, in, in to be tested. The, let's talk a little bit about mechanical integrity. Uh, mechanical integrity testing has two parts, internal and external. Internal mechanical integrity is a demonstration that, that there are no leaks in the casing. You use this a lot uh, 
for your when you're installing pipelines across the county here to, to transmit whether it's your your drinking water line a wastewater line you'll pressure test those lines to make sure there's no leaks in those we do the same thing with these wells to make sure that we can pressure test it up we pressure test usually to about 150 psi uh, and then we're allowed to operate the well up to 100 psi two-thirds of what we tested at again another safety barrier that, that's in place to make sure that that we're not uh, going to have any chance of bursting uh, uh, this casing. Um, we also use uh, uh, a TV survey to make sure, again, that the internal mechanical integrity is, is there. But that's the absence of uh, leaks in the casing. There's also what we call external mechanical integrity. Um, this is a little more difficult to show. We have to use uh, geophysical logs, but still very definitive when we show this. We have to prove the absence of any fluid movement around the outside of the casing. So, so in other words, one's going looking at going through the casing. This is looking at as, as that injected water comes out the bottom of the casing, that it cannot start to migrate up, upward because we have a bad cement job around the base of the casing. So we have a lot of good testing that's been used for well over 30 years here in, in the state to, to prove that um, that test that, that that well has been constructed and will function properly. Uh, that's this external radioactive tracer survey. We have a, 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 a tracer with a short half-life that, that we inject down that we can detect through steel casing, through this fiberglass casing to see if it's coming up around the outside of the casing. Um, and finally, uh, as, as part of uh, either internal or external, your monitoring well program, um, any wells that experience a leak uh, would show up with a water quality or a water level response very quickly. Um, uh, we, the, the, the monitoring program is, is in place to make sure that it's, it's seen and it's seen quickly and, and that would give the ability to shut it down before any, any drinking water supplies were in jeopardy. So let's talk about those uh, monitoring requirements for the monitoring wells. Uh, we, we measure pressure and flow at the injection well that's continuously monitored. So we have a record of how many gallons of water actually go down, what rates they went down, and what pressure it took to put that water in the ground. We have to uh, uh, monitor on a very regular basis what that quality of water is. Uh, it, we have to make sure that uh, uh, it's it's a almost a a you know a, a daily or weekly demonstration that what we're putting down in the well is what it's permitted to put down. And again, that cannot be hazardous waste. Uh, water quality and water level monitoring are also required uh, at, at the monitor well. This monitor well, by the way, has to be constructed within 150 feet of the injection well. So this is right there. If anything's coming up, it'll see it uh, immediately. Um, we, we're, uh, the, this is very typical of these injection wells. They have a what we call a dual zone monitoring well. It's got a deeper zone. Think of that as your early warning well. Hey, we're seeing something we don't like here. It gives you the opportunity to shut it down and see if that persists, see if that was real, what we might have been seeing. Uh, but then it also, the, uh, the, the, the very important well there is, is that that monitors the base of the underground source of drinking water. And that is a compliance well that if, if there's anything that is showing up in that well, uh, DEP will not hesitate to shut, shut this, this well down. So that's, that's very important. Um, so in terms of the usable water supply, that goes down to what we call the Suwannee limestone in this area. Anything below that is salt water. Um, that usable water supply, we will uh, be monitoring the very base of that to make absolutely certain that, that uh, the, the, the water resources of Manatee County are protected. Uh, this is my last slide here. So with the deep injection well option, um, once in operation, uh, stacks should be able to be drained within a approximately two years or possibly even less. A lot of that's gonna depend on how permeable that water is down there. Also any treatment that you uh, may need some pretreatment to make sure that this water quality is compatible with the injection zone down there. Uh, it depends on uh, how large those treatment facilities are, but uh, it, we anticipate that it, uh, within two years, the, the uh, stacks could basically be drained. Now that's the pond water up on top. Um, the the state came out with a a report that showed that it's uh, uh, approximately 52 million gallons a year, or about a million gallons a week, if, if my math is correct. Uh, um, that 
they will have to deal with. Uh, this this is something in the hundred gallon per minute range. This is this is uh, what we call either phreatic water or under drain water, but it's water that's coming off that stack and will be doing so. I, I, I think Mr. Coates' uh, uh, memo there said uh, for. Uh, 30 to actually 40 to 50 years is, is what this. So that's just keep in mind, that's, that's a something that has to be maintained. You're probably not looking at, at, at putting this well in and getting it out of service two years later. It's something that would help you to maintain that water so that it doesn't have to necessarily be routed to your uh, uh, um, wastewater treatment facilities here in, in the county, if, if that's the direction you decided to go. Uh, and with the injectable program, uh, uh, you know, you can quickly get some free board in there and, and, and there should not need have be the need to discharge any water whatsoever to uh, Bishop Harbor there or any other surface water bodies. A uh, couple of other considerations I thought I'd throw out here for discussion. Uh, uh, it does take about a minimum of six months to pull a permit and that's with the state working uh, very diligently to, and, and we suspect the state would be um, uh, in, in that mode of let's hurry and, and, and deal with this. Uh, it's taken us a year, year and a half uh, on many other projects that perhaps don't have the, the same attention given to them that Piney Point has uh, been given the last few years. Um, and then it takes approximately one year to construct these wells. These, these are, again, the, the, you can't hurry it. You have to collect the data. That's working around the clock, quite honestly. There's, there's a 24-7. Uh, usually if Santa Claus didn't come the night before, these guys are drilling. So, um, They'll, they'll usually take Christmas Day off. That's that's about it. But um, we will likely uh, require some pretreatment of, of of water uh, to make sure that this doesn't plug. Uh, uh, I'm not a treatment uh, person, so any treatment questions that that come, I'll probably have a really dumb look on my face. But uh, there's been numbers uh, uh, thrown out. I think in an Arcata study uh, back in 2016. For, that we're saying that that could be about $2 million uh, for a one MGD pretreatment system. We put in about, is it $5 million now? I don't know, but I, I, I suspect that $2 million is, is low. And I didn't want to say 2 million and, and, and all of a sudden it's 5 million, uh, you know, but is the 5 million number a good number today? I don't know. And uh, that's for others to determine. That's not my, uh, my, my area of expertise. Uh, we do that seven to eight million dollars for an injection well based on a, a project uh, that was recently bid for Tampa Electric Company. The wells came in right around six and a half million dollars. That was uh, less than a year ago. I think that seven million dollar number is probably a pretty good number for uh, for what an injection well drilling would, would cost with obviously a, a little more money for the uh, surface walk, surface infrastructure facilities and whatnot, the wellhead and, and those. Um, that is my presentation today. I, I appreciate everybody uh, uh, holding their questions because I do tend to get uh, uh, distracted when, I, when, and, uh, when, when I'm hearing questions, but I, uh, I'm certainly available for questions at your pleasure. Commissioner Van Alstenbridge and Commissioner Whitmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of questions. Some might be asked and answered. I just want clarification. Um, First of all, could you give me some examples of what is currently being pumped down existing deep wells into the lower Florida aquifer? In other words, examples of what type of, of liquids are being pumped into the lower aquifer right now, today? Okay. Um, yes, uh, the, the lower Florida aquifer um, hasn't, doesn't have a long history up here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, so, so we don't have a, a, a lot. The, the Polk Power Station that I talked with you about, um, what that is, is that's a, uh, it's an RO concentrate type water that is, they, they take water from, uh, from the city of Lakeland and from Polk County. There's waste stream that comes, wastewater, uh, domestic wastewater, if you will, uh, that has to be treated. It goes through a, a wetland area, but it has to be treated to be used in the, in their, their power plant um, as a source water in their power plant. So it's uh, what we have to do is take all the things that are concentrate, all, all the impurities of that water that are taken out of the wastewater get put into this uh, waste stream that goes down into the ground there. Uh, we talked about the RO concentrate. That's very uh, common. Uh, the lower floor in aquifer is, has a long history of use in what we call the boulder zone of, of, of South Florida. Uh, that's, included in the lower floor and aquifer. Um, 
the St. Petersburg wells is the upper floor and aquifer. So that their municipal wastewater that's injected up there is a different aquifer system than what we're looking at. Uh, but uh, the other industrial waste streams that can be put in there, uh, there are several leachate uh, from landfills uh, uh, that are permitted to put leachate uh, uh, down, down the wells. Um, there's, uh, there are different uh, uh, companies um, different industries uh, across the state. And I hate to throw one or two out there and uh, highlight them, but many, many of the in successful industries um, uh, uh, across Florida require, they've, they've got a wastewater. I, I will throw one out here because it's, it, it's near and dear probably to, to many of your hearts. Uh, it's a, certainly a big employer uh, of, in Manatee County and that's Tropicana. Uh, this is not a class one industrial injection well that they count on here but they have a Fort Pierce facility where the geology is favorable for, for a class one uh, a disposal well over there. And so exactly what types of liquid is going down the well? That's, that's ultimately my question, like in layman's yeah, terms. Industrial waste streams, uh, uh, they maybe uh, uh, have elevated metals in them. Uh, 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 other impurities that they have to uh, uh, dis dispose of from the from, from their industry uh, standards. In, in the case of Tropicana, it's, it's really just a, uh, from, the, from the fruit production process that, that is, uh, is required to be okay. disposed of. Okay, next question is, that there's a 300 foot impermeable, impermeable you know, layer of soil that separates essentially the two aquifers, right? And so we're going into the lower aquifer with our deep well, the upper aquifer is where our drinking water comes from, correct? That's correct. We have a core, a sample core here. In layman's terms, can you tell me what exactly is that soil? What is it comprised of? Yes. Uh, in, in layman's English. terms, it, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's gypsum. Okay. Uh, it's, it's uh, much of the gyps stack. Now, it's, it's actually they gypsum has filled the pores. Uh, to the point, and it's you know, which is again drywall. It, but this is not drywall that would, once it gets wet, it, it, it dissolves there. That's I hate to use the drywall terminology, but it is gypsum that has filled all the pore spacing to where water just can't can't pass through that. And it's 300 feet thick. Correct. Okay. Um, we hear a lot about the flow of our groundwater. You mentioned it flows in a southeasterly direction. Southwesterly. Uh, southwesterly. Sorry. sorry. Southwesterly direction. And we hear that groundwater eventually makes its way to the surface. This is kind of a question that I know the answer to before I ask it, but my question is when and where does the water from the lower aquifer reach the surface? Um, there's a lot of theories out there. Uh, I've heard 20, 30 miles offshore uh, that the lower floor and aquifer might essentially daylight, if you will, that, that the rocks come up to the, to the surface uh, out there. Um, so it, 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 it will, you, you know, by us pushing a little bit of water in at Piney Point, there could be a little bit of water released 20 miles out there, but it's not going to be the chance of your water ever finding its way to the, to the surface water. Again, it would have to move that far. And when you're talking about feet per year of velocity, groundwater flow velocities here, you're talking about millennia for, for it to ever trans. Uh, um, travel that distance. Hopefully we'll all be vaccinated by then. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice. Um, and then my, my next question is I've, I've been out to Piney point. Uh, I've, you know, in one of the gyp stacks they're you know, they pumped uh, sort of beach renourishment style soil from the, the expansion of Port Manatee into one of those stacks. And when they did that fish and you know, everything else kind of got thrown over there. And I'm sure some Osprey have dropped a few fish in that stack. So there are actually, there's snook and there's a habitat, a saltwater habitat in that stack. Um, so um, I'm not saying I want to jump in there and swim or eat the snook. I'm, I'm just, right. I'm not going there, I, but I'm just saying that, you know, it, it's not like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the green ooze that's, you know, coming out of the vial. So, um, but my question is, what is the, what is the quality of the water that is in the lower aquifer now compared to the quality of the water in that gyp stack? I mean, how much you know, worse is the water in the gyp stack or vice versa? Okay, uh, one of the ponds has essentially your dredge material that is essentially seawater that is uh, 
probably wouldn't would not require any type of pretreatment other than making sure that we keep the, the snook out of the well. They will start to plug the well after. Uh, but any other solids that are in the well, you want to keep those out. You you want to protect that investment that you've made and and keep any of the suspended solids or or or, or large debris out of the well. Uh, but chemistry wise, it's a very what the injection zone that we're putting this into is very similar to, the, to that one pond quality. The other has uh, 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 elevated levels of phosphorus and nitrogen. And, and, and the, the beautiful thing about injection wells, and, and, and we've documented this very well over the years with St. Petersburg, once that phosphorus hits the limestone uh, that is down there, the limestone wants to grab it and hold on to it. And, and, and in fact, this is gonna be a big part of, I think, the, the role that, that wells play in helping to clean up the Everglades, and that is, this phosphorus, just some contact time with that limestone, that phosphorus, it, in other words, any discharge that did find its way out into the bay would never have the phosphorus. You'd never be able to even detect that that was your water because the phosphorus is gone and much of the nitrogen will also be uptaken with, with uh, okay. diff different biology. So to be there. clear, we have two stacks. One is salt water, which is very similar, has very similar chemistry to the water that is in the lower aquifer where we would be pumping Correct. this too. Um, the second stack is high in nitrogen, which you're telling me limestone is a natural, will naturally filter the nitrogen out of the water millennium from now when it works its way to the surface. Nitrogen is a little more conser more conservative and will tend to stay oh, around a little longer. I phosphorus, I phosphorus though, uh, very, very short okay. Uh, uh, okay. attenuation time. Okay. Um, the up, where, when you have a well, the upper aquifer drinking water is constantly being tested and monitored you know, around that pipe. Is that correct? Around that well? Yes. Okay. Yes. And at, out at our dam, our drinking water is constantly being tested and monitored as well, correct? That's correct. Okay. Six months to permit, one year to construct. So we're looking at 18 months to completion. Price tag, you're dancing around. Well, I, I can <laughs> speak important. very, very confidently about the, the well costs, the, the, the drill. So in other words, to get the well in, I think the the pre-treatment costs, one will 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 know just that a lot of that pre-treatment is going to be what we find during the well construction. In other words, if there's a fair amount of permeability there, we might be able to relax some of the uh, uh, geochemistry, some of the chemical some of the pre-treatment process. if it's if it's really tight and even the slightest difference between the water chemistry, that might take a little bit more uh, treatment. So we won't know the answer there. Uh, even the engineers won't know the answer to that. But I just, I, again, I apologize that I can't speak to that. Uh, um, I've just, all I can do is look at the studies that engineers have done and said it's about a $2 million process. What would, an, an ex, what would throughout the, the process, what's an inexpensive well and what is an expensive well? Can you give me a range? Um, the, these are expensive wells. Um, when we go into the lower floor, uh, you're spending about twice as much. Uh, St. Petersburg, we just put four injection wells in and I keep, hate to keep using the St. Petersburg, but they're your neighbors. Uh, their wells are half the depth. Uh, 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 they're, they're only to about a thousand feet, um, 700 feet of casing. Those wells were $2 million wells uh, uh, that we put in just a couple of years ago to help keep them from having any, any unpermitted discharges uh, going out into the bay. These are $7 million wells. The well I spoke of in Polk County because they had to even go a little deeper because of the depth of fresh water in their county that was about a $15 million well, so almost twice as much yet for them. So these are expensive wells. Uh, uh, we realize that. All the more reason to make sure it's done right and it's protected once it's in the ground with the proper pretreatment to make sure it doesn't plug. From a financial standpoint, what is my worst case scenario with this well? Uh, um, there's always that chance. You know, I. I am very confident we haven't seen any of these wells fail. Um, I am very, very confident. If you were asked me today, could I guarantee you though that you would go out here and spend $7 million and you'd have an injection zone? Um, I, I can't guarantee that. Uh, I can't guarantee what mother nature has given us. I can guarantee you we're gonna look hard and make sure that if it's there, it's, that we'll find it and, 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 and get it, uh, use a, a, you a usable well. But there's always that chance, and we always tell every one of our injectable clients we cannot uh, guarantee what the geology is going to look like. Saying that, though, I haven't seen any wells like that uh, that have 
been designed to these kind of standards and not been able to be placed into operation. So that, that would be your worst case, but a very, very unlikely chance of that happening. I think seven, seven million is likely my worst case scenario. For the well. Financially. Yes. For the well. uh, plus, okay. plus the pre-treatment costs. Plus uh, the two if, million if, for pre-treatment. Right. So I'm at nine million. Um, worst case, again, that's that, that that's two million dollar number. This numbers, isn't my money, so yeah, I have yeah, to you know, I, no I, worst understand, case I understand that completely. Um, worst case is that Oh yeah, eight eight plus five because we had five as that what we believe is probably worst case. So it, I, I would say thirteen million if, so if you 13, had to okay, plan. Do we hear fourteen? No, I'm just saying. Uh, okay, so we're <laughs> yeah, thirteen million worst case, and, and and I mean, thirteen million dollars is a lot of money, but we have already committed um, six million dollars of our money and uh, are likely to receive a, a matching six million from the state, uh, which puts us at twelve, um, and. Uh, you know, Misty and Carol are very good at raising money, so I think we can find the rest of it. Uh, the extra million is no big deal. Um, okay, and then uh, I think that's that's about it. I think I've asked most of what I want to know. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good questions. Uh, I've heard this a few times throughout the years, and um, what I when I had my briefing again, um, what really has struck home with me and that's why I'm glad we're bringing this up again and we want to know more of all options versus just one or two is because the long-term cost after this. Um, the deep well, uh, as you just heard and I had written in my notes that we have to monitor it for 40 to 50 years because no matter if you use a surface water treatment and not the deep well, you still get millions of gallons of water coming out of those stacks every year. So that's going to be a cost to somebody, and I'm sure this, the, 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 the people that want to treat the surface water aren't going to be around for 40 to 50 years. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the double lining. Um, we have a, and I know you didn't bring this up, and are you going to? We have, we have two wells in North Buffalo Creek that are online that are class five, and what, a class one that's going to be um, for an RO plan. Am I correct? Okay. Um, so we have been doing this. Is Jeff wants to clarify it. Jeff, you want to? Oh, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so to me, cost versus benefit getting this done. Remember, if we could get this water out, we still got the sediment and all the everything in the stacks. And that's going to have to be treated. And I asked staff. I mean, it has to be covered. It'll cost from what staff told me, Mike Gore, on the prices for fill right now. Millions and I'm thinking like a hundred million or more to cover this with some kind of covering, unless <clears throat> a person that owns the port you has a vendor. Like we've heard the word fly ash before, where um, they use that to store there. I don't know what they would do. That's not our problem. Our problem is to get this water out, and we need to start moving because um, it's going to overflow. So. My question was, um, do you agree that no matter what we do, um, we still are going to have that excessive water coming out of those stacks for many, many years, 40 to 50 years? That is, that's correct. So it's nice to have a Band-Aid uh, issue, but this is a long-term plan that we've got to be in partnership with the state. Uh, the overlapping casings into the injection well. Uh, if I remember my briefing, they also have monitors in the middle of them to monitor, correct, Charlie or somebody? Yes, okay. Um, and, and that's about it. I, I'm looking, and, and I think that's why the board had gone in the direction before was to look at this deep well before it was taken off the plate. I think we should look at all options, and if we have to contribute something, I think we need to do what's best for the citizens. And um, are we going to get stuck doing this for 40 to 50 years on a problem um, that private sector caused, not us? You know, so we do have to treat it. But I still um, am glad that you're making this presentation so that all of you guys can hear what we've heard for a few years now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ex oh, in my briefing, yeah, they gave it to us, but I had a they had to make a small one for me. Um, fantastic 
presentation. If you had a briefing, thank you. Got it. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, fantastic presentation. It took me back to my days when I was going to college and working on a soils testing laboratory. And so I used to take cores like that and see how much pounds per square inch they could endure before they exploded. So I had a job doing that. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, you know, what this casing reminds me of is how we move towards uh, petroleum tanks for gas stations. Mm -hmm. So every time you build a racetrack now or a Wawa, those tanks that hold the fuel have the same sort of design. They have one container, a monitoring container, and another container. So uh, there can't be a, a leak. So I, I do have a couple of questions. So what if the monitoring well showed a problem? What, what, would, the, what would happen? Just take us through that. Okay. Um, and, and this probably goes back to that worst case, you know, what is my worst case scenario? What if, that, what if we spend all this money and, the, and we see that the geology is leaking? Well, um, what, what happens is if there is fluid migration, you would be shut down. I'm happy to say that we haven't seen that scenario. We haven't had any class one industrial injection wells shut down because we're, we're so careful making sure that we have adequate confinement that we design these not to leak. Um, so there is that outside chance that that could happen. If it does happen, we have to stop, monitor, and, and, and make sure that, um, that this isn't uh, um, going to ha in any way uh, uh, harm the, the potential drinking water supplies. So we have the monitoring well that shows us anything that is happening that is unusual. And as I understand it, there would also be a change in pressure that would be identified in the deep well that would maybe our first indicator that there's a problem. Changes in pressure in the, in the deep well really would be more a function of how well that is performing, how well the pretreatment is performing to make sure that we're not having plugging of that, of your uh, $13 million investment, if you will, uh, or, or seven or 8 million for the, the well itself. Um, we do have ways, and, and the county has a lot of experience in terms of when you see some plugging in a well, that's not indicative of the, the formation. The rock is starting to get, get more. It's more of a function of, uh, of back pressure. Think about it in a water plant. It's, it's your filters being plugged, and you have to backwash those filters. That's essentially what we would have to do here is go in, clean up that, uh, uh, which is always happening right on the, the well bore itself. Um, we do have to measure pressure within the monitoring wells. The pressure in the form of water level, uh, uh, what the level of that aquifer is doing. That's your first sign that, hey, there might be some communication here. So you don't necessarily have to wait until you see the fluid movement. If you, uh, uh, we don't believe there would be any communication whatsoever when you start injecting down here that you're gonna see any kind of a water level response uh, uh, up top there. So. Okay. All right. And, and being a lifelong Floridian, you know, I have always seen that we have sinkholes in certain parts of the, of the state, you know, Polk County and Pasco County, but we never see them in Manatee and Sarasota. And I understand it, maybe, I don't know if I'm correct or not, that it's all because of that confining layer. And we don't have as much limestone, which is like a big, uh, those tarpon sponges that we're all familiar with, with the right. big holes in them. Uh, our, our geology is much different. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to me, if we're, if we're hearing about deep wells that are being constructed in Pasco, is a, a deep well constructed in Manatee County the same as a deep well constructed in Pasco? Would you say it's more safe, less safe? You know, how is it different? Um, the, the way it's different is there's the risk of sinkholes during well construction initially. We're, we're down well below that sinkhole horizon that we have to be concerned about in terms of us uh, uh, changing levels and pressures in the aquifer that would cause, uh, many sinkholes are caused when you bring a water supply online, you fire up the production wells and you have a change in, I think you've probably recently seen, it's been a few years now, but out in Plant City uh, for, for freeze control, they had to fire up some wells. That's all really got to do with the very, very shallow geology, the top 100 feet, if you will, and, and, and how that those rock layers, the clays and the sands and the rock itself, how that's all, uh, all, all been laid down. Uh, what we're talking about is down, same up in 
Polk County or Pasco County, I'm sorry, is, is proposing to use the exact same zone that we're proposing to use here at the lower Florida and Aquifer. They're counting on the middle confining unit. We're in the middle of drilling that well. It's, it's uh, over a thousand feet of confinement that we've seen between. Uh, so where it's 300 feet here, they've seen there's, there's a thousand feet of impermeable rock uh, up there. We may find it's a little bit thicker here. Again, there aren't a, a tremendous number of these wells in the lower Florida and that have been drilled. We were fortunate enough to have one uh, uh, in close proximity here that we could share with you. Okay, last question. So when this water moves, and we understand it migrates, you know, inches, it migrates very, very slowly. And feet. you said feet per, feet, year. feet per year. Okay, so feet per year to get 20 mi miles out in the Gulf where it may, you know, a long, long time from now may surface. Would this water be the same water that we pre-treated and injected? Or would there be some sort of natural biology that occurs and does the water change when it finally surfaces? Yeah, it, 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 the underground has a, a tremendous capacity to clean things up. And it, all, all you have to look at is, um, I don't know if any of you have, say, gone to Devil's Mill Hopper up in uh, uh, the Gainesville area, where you, you see that there's this really tannic surface water going down into the aquifer. Well, they're pulling, it goes down in the aquifer and, and the total organic carbon uh, uh, decreases. It, we say it attenuates basically, but it, it, it goes away relatively quickly. The coliform bacteria die off. There's, there's a lot of real improvements that mother nature provides once it hits that groundwater. They then pull it out for the city's water supply, not too, that far away, a few miles away, where they're pulling out this pristine drinking looking water with very minimal levels of treatment. So you've got, uh, 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 from the Peace River coming out of Lake Hancock, there's a lot of water supply that, again, that, that colored surface water goes in the ground and, and, and looks like spring water uh, at a very short distance from where it, it, it went into the ground. So uh, yes, there's a, you'd have a hard time, even if we, if we could put a tracer in that and, and, and find out where it disappeared out in the Gulf, you'd, you, it would have lost that signature, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years uh, in, in the making, so. Not seeing anyone on the list, we're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. She called you a girl. <laughs> Don't talk to me. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go to public comment at this time. Um, I do have one person signed up, Ron Noble. Uh, Ron, you'll have three minutes, and as long as it, it stays on the topic of the deep water injection well at this point. Thank you. Uh, is Can you hear me now? Oh, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss the Deep Well Project, Commissioners. My name is Ron Noble. I'm working with a company named AquaClean Environmental, and AquaClean is uh, interested in partnering with the county on a Deep Well Project. We have been considering a Deep Well Project at Piney Point for some time now. Uh, we have been in discussions with DEP, with HRK, and uh, just initiating some discussions with your utility staff at this point. Uh, AquaClean is a company that's been around for 30 years in Florida. It's a Florida-based company. They specialize in the treatment and disposal of industrial wastewaters throughout the state of Florida. They enjoy a very good reputation with DEP and uh, happy to provide you some additional information uh, on, on their company. Um, is, is, uh, Mr. McNeil has, I think, very, very well vetted the... Uh, sanctity of the deep well injection process in Florida and the permitting process established by DEP. So he's taken a lot of my presentation, which uh, is great. He did, did a fantastic job. It is proven technology. Um, there is always going to be some opposition to deep well technology, but um, you know, there's going to be opposition to, to anything that we deal with at Piney Point. The surface water discharge uh, has its detractors. The memo that was added to your backup this morning on the nitrogen consortium I think makes surface water discharge a very difficult proposition uh, long-term and short-term for Piney Point and getting that, even getting that permitted to start with. The other thing that, that the UIC well offers is the, um, not only the consistency, but the long-term viability to serve this project. Uh, it's gonna take several years to simply drain the stacks of 750 million gallons that are there now, but there is 30 to 50 years of long-term care that comes after that. And that's where a deep well fits in perfectly. The surface water discharge program and that vendor is not going to be there 30 or 50 years down the road to be able to cost effectively handle that water. And that's not water that the Manatee County Utilities Department is, is going to want to treat as well. Um, I want to be clear and kind of reinforce what Mr. McNeil said. This is not simply an injection well that would be proposed by AquaClean. It would also include a pretreatment plant uh, where water would be pretreated prior to injection. There will be some pH issues with the northern stack, the southern stack. There will be some sedimentation and solids removal issues. So the water will be pretreated, uh, you know, prior to its prior to its in injection. AquaClean's proposal would even to be uh, to obtain a separate permit from DEP that would allow for treatment of this industrial wastewater and have its own parameters. We would have that permit in addition to the deep injection well. When it comes to the, to the financial aspects of this well, um, I, I think AquaClean, you will find, is the only provider uh, an alternative out there that is willing to involve their own money into this project. Uh, I, in partnering with the county on this project, AquaClean would bring millions of dollars to the table for the construction and operation of the well. Um, I think that allows the project to move forward now. I'm gonna have to ask you to close very soon here. We can okay. give you another 30 seconds. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a difficult legislative session to, to be awarded that $6 million appropriation. AquaClean is willing to put in millions of dollars of its own money. And if the county still has $6 million to appropriate to this project, we can get a deep well built and uh, really commence the process right now of emptying the stacks. If not, we're just kicking the can down the road, as we've talked about in, in other workshops. So the time is now. Um, I'm willing to answer questions, be able to meet with all of you or your utilities department is needed going forward. But uh, we look forward to the opportunity to try and partner with the county on this important project. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to come forward? Do we have anyone on the phone? All right. We'll go ahead and close public comment. Commissioner Whitmore. 
Madam Chair, I don't think staff's done with their presentation. Are we doing another part of it? Yes, we are. We okay. only did the one section. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. I was, I was starting we to wonder if we'd pay the bill. Hold on. Caller 189. 189, please press star six. Can you guys vote? 189, star six. Go ahead, caller. Good morning, commissioners. This is um, Dawn Kitterman for the record. I did have public comments I'd like to make. Hey, Dawn, you need but to I turn wasn't your sure. down. Yeah, I'm Dawn, moving away from it. I'm so sorry. Dawn, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this has mm -hmm. to be in reference to the deep water injection well. Okay, and that was so exactly the question I comment on this. Go ahead. I, I understand. That was exactly the question okay. I was about to ask. Um, Great. So, Thank you. will there be an opportunity at this meeting for the public to make any comments about the opening of this meeting? Uh, probably not. You will be able to do that in our next open commission meeting. This is a workshop, so okay. we only allow public I comment on issues that are on the agenda. I appreciate your guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other calls? That's all, Madam Chair. Okay. Charlie, you want to finish up? Before Charlie comes up, uh, I'd like to, our attorney's opinion at the end of the meeting, it's been set for years, and you as chair in the past also have allowed public comment on anything at the end. Do we really want to rehash this next Tuesday? I'd rather get it over with. Whatever it's going to be, Commissioner but Whitmore, I, we've I'm not always asking, I've got only the floor, allowed public chair, comment to, on agenda I've items got the for floor, a workshop. I'm talking to the attorney. I know you did. Didn't, didn't allow him to answer. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. Why am I not surprised? Turn this thing on. So there's the difference between what's required by our rules of procedure and what is in the discretion of the chair. The rules of procedure require us to take public comment only on items that are on the agenda. That's all that we are required to do by our rules. But with the resolution that our chair wrote that we could change our procedures anytime we want, we could allow public comments to get all this over with at the end of the meeting if we wanted. If the majority of the vo board supported it, am I correct? Not in this meeting, no, because okay. you cannot vote. This sure. is a work session. There's no action to be taken no. in this meeting. So that would so be we'll something have you'd to have to do in an Tuesday. action meeting. Okay. There is the discretion of the chair. If she wants to allow public comment on other items, she can, but she's not required to by our rules. Well, you just, I know what you just said, but we as a board can override the chair's decision. In meetings where you can vote, yes. Okay. You then can't I got vote it. Only regular decision. meetings then, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Charlie, go ahead. I think it's okay now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, close our presentation by offering to you that we, we have in your backup material a, a full uh, discussion from EPA to the Tampa Bay SUA programs and the Water Management District about how the, phosphate, how the Nitrogen Management Consortium of Tampa Bay will operate, the limitations of allocations, and the, the points that, alloc that nitrogen has been fully allocated already in the Tampa Bay area and that if additional industrial discharges or municipal discharges are anticipated, how that will have to be handled with the trades. So if you want any further explanation for that, we're prepared to do that, but I would understand you would want to move forward. Um, are, there, are there any questions on, on that where uh, Mr. Brown could um, answer those questions? No. Commissioner Servia. I just want to make sure before we leave this topic that I understand it correctly. So what I heard, and maybe Rob Brown can uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong. So if we went with this option, um, there would never be a release of water that would cause an algae bloom or red tide because it would always be injected okay. and... <clears throat> Yes, that's correct. Is that all right? So there's no surface distribution. No, um, other than the stormwater 
leaving the property for which HRK already has a nitrogen allocation for that discharge into the bay. Okay, and it sounds like, I mean, there's so many safeguards, I guess it's regulated nationally or federally by statute. I mean, you've got the, the fluid is pretreated. You got the, the, what do we call it? The, the, um, the core lining casing, two of those with a monitoring in between uh, and a monitoring well. It just seems like, I mean, there's so many levels of protection. Uh, do you think, I mean, I guess all of those are needed because in every situation you want it to be safe. So it just seems like it's ultra safe. Well, we've attempted uh, to provide you uh, the industry's answer uh, to this technology. And as we mentioned, there's other technologies there, but the intent for this work session was to give you the full disclosure of what we believe to be uh, the industry standard for this technology. There are other technologies. And I might, it might springboard onto that just to, to highlight, returning to the appropriation request that we made of the Florida House and the Florida Senate, there are some very specific questions in the application for that, for that appropriation that had to be answered. For instance, provide specific details on how the funds will be spent. And we answer that by saying, we would spend it for fixed capital construction, including the feasibility study to determine the environmentally sound method of closure, followed by a competitive procurement process and selection of a contractor to complete dewatering and treatment without naming the, the method, without naming the system, but naming that we have a competitive procurement procedure here by ordinance that will allow us to fairly uh, determine the right, the right method and the, and the competitive selection for that method, which can include, which can include the public and private partnerships that was mentioned here or any other public private partnerships you might see uh, down the road. Well, and I appreciate that you wrote that flexibility in there because that's where we all ultimately want to get. So that's wonderful. You know, I, I don't know who it was that, uh, I forget the gentleman's name who spoke about the legislature possibly granting us that appropriation, but I just, so all of you know, and I've, you probably know this too, I've spoken with so many legislators about, you know, what is the budget looking like? And they've told me, you know, don't hold your breath because it's gonna be a lean year and it's gonna be very, very difficult to get any money for any project. So I'm glad we're asking. If you don't ask, you don't get, but uh, we have to be aware of the reality too. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Is that it, Charlie? Okay. Oh. All right, well, Madam Administrator, item three. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Um, commissioners, we'd like to um, have the financial management department director and their staff move into the room. It'll just be a few minutes for transition. And when um, Director Brewer is all set up, then we'll begin the budget work session under your CIP that was extended from Tuesday's meeting. And um, if you just, as you recall, there was some discussion about the pre-budget work session prior to this portion of the meeting on Tuesday. And um, as a reminder, that is an ongoing discussion for the financial management department in this board. And I think you should always feel um, the opportunity to be bringing up any concerns, questions, or clarifications that you need throughout these next few months. Um, Ms. Brewer has going to lead the discussion on our capital improvement plan and how the capital improvement plan projects are brought forward. Again, when you have the opportunity in a work session to be able to help educate the citizens as well as answer questions to the board, you take it. And so we'll be recapping slightly how capital improvement plan projects are brought forward. And then uh, moving on again to say that this is a focus on the transportation element. So again, the transportation element of your capital improvement plan. Ms. Brewer will conclude by offering future dates for this board to discuss the parks areas and the 
public safety areas. You obviously can bring up any items you'd like in the work session. However, we'll be she will be more prepared with those appropriate departments um, throughout the course of the next month. So with that, Jan, are you yes. ready to take over? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you to your staff for um, all the hard work they've been doing. Madam Chair, I just got a point of order question. Uh, we just had a long presentation and that's that. I mean, are we bringing up at another meeting or everybody just left? I mean, we usually don't end meetings like that where they just walk out and we don't have a plan or- It'll probably, if I can uh, answer, if I may answer, it will be, I'm sure, brought up probably in Tuesday's meeting to see if you wanna take a vote. Well, it wasn't discussed if we were interested in doing that. That's, well, I mean, we usually kind of round something up at every meeting. So, so am I incorrect? Commissioner Whitmore, can we just move forward? Or would, asked, you rather, can, would you rather talk to, go ahead. Yes, I would. I, I would like I would to prefer it. Yes, good. Um, to the, I guess I have to talk to the vice chair. Um, just wanted to. I'm going to ask, since the chair doesn't want to acknowledge me or speak to me. Um, Commissioner Whitmore, please stop. You don't have to be rude. Please be quiet. Um, Mr. Chair, Excuse Mr. Me? Vice Chair. What are we doing? Um, we all ended this meeting. Are we just forgetting or are we bringing this up on a future work session or a future meeting? Has anybody had any thoughts when they left besides just walking out? No? This is only like my third work session, so <laughs> I'm new here. Uh, I, I, assume, I assume we were gonna talk about it, but if it's gonna come up, we can't vote, no. so. I know. I'm presuming the last time we had the meeting with NCLEAR, they gave their presentation. Now this was the opportunity for Deepwell in large part for the three of us who had been here to see it and ask questions like Commissioner Van Ostenbridge did. So I would presume we were gonna to get to a point in time where there's an actionable item associated with Piney Point so we can finally make a decision and move forward. Before when that is, I, I don't Before go to Tallahassee know. probably? I mean, we need to have it on a meeting before then, okay. I would, I would hope so. As you know, you are more than able to put an agenda item on the agenda for Tuesday's meeting. I think we have a lot on Tuesday's meeting. I don't think we should put it down. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, from, from the workshop perspective, when we're talking about the Piney Point and the options, um, I think that we are supposed to, we normally would talk the options out now and see can we come to some type of consensus. Um, even with the information that was presented, I'm still not necessarily slant one way or the other, to be, to be honest with you. Um, maybe there are more questions, but where we are prior to trips to Tallahassee, I, I do think from a consensus of the board, we need to say, well, um, we 75% here, or this is what the board is going, that direction the board want to go. I'm not now is the time for us to talk about that openly before we come up with something that we're gonna say that we're gonna vote on to move forward. Am I correct? I would assume. Um, Madam Administrator. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Just as a reminder, um, you do have a, your next meeting after the February 23rd meeting, your next regular meeting is March the 9th. And we would just, um, you know, take the direction of the board. As as Madam Chairman mentioned, there are there is a section on the agenda for commissioners to add agenda items. And if um, that type of a request might be made next Tuesday, it's it's certainly whatever the wish of the board is. And I don't think we've planned a trip to Tallahassee, to my knowledge. No, ma'am. Um, we have we been on hold. Right yes, we have been on hold to uh, receive input back from the state as to what the status of briefings will be right now. I think I think what they're saying to you is there may be uh, online or Zoom meeting type briefings or there could be smaller ones, but you're correct. There hasn't been a full decision of how they're handling that in Tallahassee. No, and to my knowledge, I mean, I'm not doing anything in Tallahassee. Yes, correct. So, Commissioner, um, who are you? <laughs> Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I've, I've been had it up for a while. Sorry. No, I it's didn't a, see you. I know you don't. <laughs> um, okay, so what I would like to suggest, I know it would help me, is that um, when we put this on an agenda, if we could have both of the options we've heard about, like on a, a graphic that, that shows so we can compare 
apples to apples. What's the cost of this one? What's the cost of this one? It's the time frame of this one, the time frame of this one. Some of those crucial questions, if we could see them side by side when we discuss it. And I'd also like to hear from staff if the timing of the, was it March 9th, the date that I heard? March 9th. Does that timing work with all that we have going on with the appropriations request and uh, any other matters? I think I can address that um, in a general way. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, the appropriations requests have been submitted based on your previous discussion and um, they can be um, they can be altered or changed um, throughout the process um, up until we're told we cannot and so I do believe when we looked into it for you previously just to make sure if you had any changes that it was possible that some adjustments could be made but it they have been submitted anyone else Commissioner Cruz yeah, that, that's maybe what I want to figure out from a timing standpoint. We, we, we voted to put the $6 million request in in exchange for our $6 million. But we always talk about kicking Piney Point down the road. And we've had like three work sessions and all of them seem to be about Piney Point. I guess my question is, what's the next actionable item for this board? Are we deciding whether to leave the $6 million in? And, and if we get it, then we sit down and decide, are we going to clean the water? Are we going to dump the water? What are we going to do with it? Or are we trying to make that decision in a timely manner as a complement to the $6 million request that was made? If so, you know, it seems like we keep pushing this and pushing this. Now we're going to wait till March 9th to, to even have dialogue. And then we're going to say, you know what? We can't really dialogue this here efficiently. Let's have a work session. So <laughs> I, I know how things work. <laughs> right? So honestly, it's an honest question. What's our timing to make a decision as a board on what our intention is and what's the next actionable item? post this work session yeah um i just quickly try to answer a few portions of what commissioner cruz has requested and i think it's clear to me that um you've you've had continued discussions not quite all on the same page um so i do understand that um from briefings too that y'all have still some questions um it's my understanding that um there will obviously be tracked that request would be tracked through the process with um the state as they begin to review their uh, budget and of course we don't fully know whether or not an item would be considered until the may or june time frame um, however um, it's it's clear that it, it feels as if you'd like to have some more discussion about um, the, the various options and funding and so um, i don't know that there's a there's any other action fully to take at your meetings unless you're going to clarify the position of the board as as it depends on whether funding would be received or funding would not be received from the state. Did you want to <clears throat> go ahead? Charlie's here. Just a follow up to it. Um, Charlie, you you submitted this yourself. So I'll, I'll ask you, does it benefit our request? And maybe this is more of a question for for a will or somebody, but does it benefit our request if we show up in Tallahassee with a firm decision? Right now, it seems like we're so wishy-washy in terms of what we intend to do with it. We're just saying, can we have six million bucks and then we'll figure out how to spend it? But do you think our presentation is stronger for the request if we come in and say, this board has laid out their options, discussed it, and we know this is exactly what we're doing if you give us this money. Does that strengthen our, our argument? Uh, Charlie Hunsker, I'd have to... I'd have to reply in the affirmative. I'd have to say yes. But I, I also want to say that uh, the the legislative process is like, uh, is, as Commissioner, as uh, Mr. Corrier mentioned, is a complicated process and we won't know until May how that, that will pan out. Uh, it was certainly to the degree that the state will confer with the Department of Environmental Protection on, and they will, on how this money will, should be uh, utilized to Manatee County. Um, it would be helpful for the Department of Environmental Protection to hear our intentions. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Van Alstenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are only two items on the menu for us to choose from. I mean, it's not as if, you know, we're staring into the abyss, unsure what we're going to do. And we've had lengthy discussions. We're narrowing it down. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, you're right, obviously, Commissioner Cruz, if, if we were had voted and had a firm position that this is what we wanted to do, that would probably be more beneficial to us. But I don't think we're going to scare the state off because 
you know, we're down to two things and we're weeks or days away from making a, a firm decision. I don't know. I, I would prefer to, you know, to, to come to a solid conclusion, to have all the facts and to have exhausted discussion uh, as opposed to committing $6 million in six minutes. Um, I, I would err on the side of talking a little for a little too long. Uh, my question would be Charlie or uh, Madam Administrator, um, the $6 million commitment matching commitment from the state, is that solely for water treatment or would, is that for a solution, be it deep well or water treatment? It's for a solution. For and a solution. I, for a solution, uh, not named okay. in our application. And I would encourage us to talk about this in terms of technologies rather than any particular company sure. or, or any process. Technologies of surface treatment or deep well injection. Okay. And uh, Madam Chairman, if I could just follow up quickly. Um, also um, for new board members, you receive updates throughout the session on the status of, of your of various requests. So committees that review them, the status of where the request is, uh, comments, those are provided and, and you know through the current lobbyists that we work with, Dean Mead. And so you will get those, have an opportunity to have those regularly so that you can see where the request is or some status or if it's been discussed or when it's going to be discussed. And it, it, you know, it appears to me that that's gonna be very important to this group that you know the status. Uh, Madam Administrator, I'm gonna go ahead at this point. Would you please put that on our first meeting? What was the date, March 9th? The 9th. You do have a meeting on March 9th. Okay, would you please put that? You can put it under me if you want uh, as a, an agenda item to make Thank a decision you. on Piney Point, please. Okay, we will prepare that. And Thank you, you very and much. I, I, that will give you time to make sure you get all the information that Commissioner Servia was referring to with the two charts, et cetera, et cetera. And I just still have the floor, so I would just conclude in saying that you know, I support that. Yeah, I, I'm closing I in on. You would. Yeah, I'm closing in on uh, a decision, and certainly by March 9th, uh, I will have done the rest of my due diligence, and I'll be prepared to make Perfect. a vote. So, thank you. Anyone else, Commissioner Satcher, Commissioner Whitmore? I'll get to you in a moment. You've spoken a couple of times. Commissioner Satcher has not. Commissioner Satcher, go ahead. Um, so, I just wanted to ask on the record, um, Charlie, speaking about the nitrogen, um, which. We basically had, you know, two different, uh, one day was dedicated to treating it, surface treatment. Today's been dedicated to deep well injection. Um, but the, the nitrogen kind of goes back to the previous as far as the surface treatment. And that is a matter of cost that wasn't necessarily included in our conversation earlier. Am I correct about that? that? that and just expound if so. Yes, sir, that is correct. The, the in-clear presentation, in, in fairness to their presentation, they identified cost in their estimate and they identified other costs that was not part of their estimate. And in that chart and that slide that they produced in that work session, the um, nitrogen offset, as was described, the nitrogen treatment offset that, that would be required was not included in their cost by their own chart. And so we understand that uh, we're having to go out in the future, um, so we're not asking for perfection, but uh, you estimate the nitrogen offset cost to be, first of all, an ongoing expense as the water's treatment, and second of all, like, yes. are we talking, you know, a, a million a year? Are we talking five million a year? No, well, it, and I, I'm not asking yes. for accuracy, I'm asking yeah. for just a sense of what, just for decision-making purposes. I, I can describe the, the technology. We would need to, we, would, we or another party would need to provide a method of nitrogen removal for an existing system that increases their removal proportionate or exactly the same as the amount of nitrogen being introduced with our new service treatment option. Somebody would have to pay the cost of that um, those costs could be uh, on an annual basis with a, with a chemical treatment process, or we could construct, we or someone could construct a very large uh, surface stormwater pond system to remove the nitrogen in a, in a biological way, nat 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 natural way, at cost. Costs that were not discussed or disclosed in the uh, in clear presentation. There are several ways, and what I'm trying to say is there's several ways to offset that nitrogen load with technologies and um, 
but those costs were not disclosed. Um, Commissioner Whitmore and then Commissioner Bellamy. We aren't responsible for future treatment, guys. We're committing $6 million, unless we're going to commit our citizens and taxpayers for 40 to 50 years. On our platform now, I think it says, and that's why I, I, I raised my hand again, on our platform it says that we support whatever, but not a deep well. That's why I wanted us to come up with some kind of conclusion that we are going to bring this up in the future. Um, so again, the only two options are surface water treatment or the deep well. The, the nitrogen that you're talking about, those are going to be co other costs in, concurred by the owner of HRK or um, the state. I'm not going to commit my citizens to millions every year on something that we don't own and we aren't responsible for, a private sector. Um, but yes, we can help get the emergency part under control, but then that's up to the landowner, not not us. But I do think our platform does say we don't support deep well. I know our previous platform said we support the state on options uh, to you know get this stopped. Or I can't, I'm not sure exactly how it was, including deep well or any other options. What we had said before. So what we do on March 9th, we can. But in our platform, I think right now we can't. And because it's in there. Am I right? Yeah. And yeah, okay. And, and Madam Chair, I, I think I need to correct the record of my, my statements earlier also, because uh, if you recall, commissioners, you, you received a letter from individually um, on the record from a company that is currently providing evaporation technology. And they indicated that with enhanced, um, with enhanced technology, they too would be a viable option for dewatering through full evaporation of the water on top of the stack. Hmm. I will say, now that we're familiar with the intricacies and complexities of this problem, that spray evaporation will not be very useful in treating the water inside the stack for the next 40 years. Uh, that, that will pose a problem uh, for a technology that tries to, in effect, boil off or evaporate the water, leaving behind uh, the residue and uh, that that is concentrated in the stack itself. And so, um, again, I, I reference this to technologies rather than companies, but truly someone would stand before you to say, well, no, wait a minute, um, there's surface water treatment, there's deep well injection, and there's enhanced evaporation. And, and whether or not those technologies are viable for Manatee County is a decision that the board needs to make. Charlie, I'm going to butt in at this point. I, I might be wrong, but I think the last, um, um, the legislative delegation meeting that we had, I don't think we specified in that, uh, you know, one solution or the other. I think we kind of left it open, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think deep water was taken off the agenda. So uh, we need to check that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right because I remember standing there reading uh, that to the delegation. So um, we need to check that, but I don't think that a deep water injection well was removed or mentioned as being removed in that. So check that. And then I'll have another comment um, to make. Uh, Commissioner Bellamy? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a couple things here. Um, well, I thought we had two. It seems like a third option has slid to the, um, <laughs> has slid, <laughs> slid on the table in, in the ninth hour, unless I missed it, Charlie, and I, and I apologize um, if I did. But here's what's, what's coming to my attention. I want to make sure the board, um, in the midst of this pandemic, we have a placeholder. We don't have a guarantee. We have, we have a placeholder and we, don't and we do not have a guarantee. And I'm concerned about some what if scenarios. What if we do not get the $6 million match? What if we only receive half of that? Um, what discussion or what steps from the board perspective, are we prepared to take? Um, and I'm gonna be honest with you, the, the word placeholder is just what it is. You know, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure based on everything, and we know that there will be a lot of cuts this, this year coming around. And I'm not necessarily sure how much of a priority this, this will be. So what are we prepared to discuss, or what do we need to discuss for that particular scenario? What if we do not get the match of $6 million? What, what, what's, what's next? 
And with the three, we have to discuss it because it's a realistic uh, approach, especially with our current political climate right now. But um, my, my other thing with, with the third option that's, that's, that's out there, well, I'll, I'll, I'll end on that because I got some more notes, so I'll wait. I'll wait, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. I do wanna add at this point, I, it's occurred to, to me, I don't think you guys have heard about this. Um, Piney Point has entered into an agreement with a company um, to look at, they're looking at cleaning the water, not a deep water injection well, they're looking at the other process. So they've already signed an agreement uh, with them. They, I guess they feel that really they, you know, they'd rather see that first if it's possible, but I can't speak for them, but um, I did get a copy of that sent to me. I'll send it to all of you. Commissioner Bellamy, do you want to add to that? I'm uh, uh, sure if, if they have already <laughs> taken, taken certain steps, I mean, what, what, as far as toward the, the water treatment from us, from the board perspective, well, how if I may to, to add, right. I don't know. This was not something that, um, you know, I don't know that much about it. I mean, obviously, this is a private company, two private companies that have gone together, and we just happened to find out about it. But I can tell you that I know DEP has not signed off on it. Okay. I can tell you that. So I guess from a board perspective, wouldn't it be mindful for us to I'd be aware of clearly of what's going on with that mm -hmm. before we identify whether or not we're going to say a deep well or uh, water treatment or the new one that Charlie just brought to the table. And, and the reason why, because again, that's private. They can pretty much do with their property what they want to do, am I correct? And if they've already said that they're going to look at a deep well injection. That's not what they're doing. It's not deep water that they're looking into. They're looking at cleaning the water. And please don't ask me what the process is because I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that I, I, we, yeah, I only found out by accident. So I don't have all the details on it. I'm just letting you know that they, they have done that at this point, but I don't know the details. I can't answer the questions yet for you. Okay, and I don't know how this takes place, but can we reach out to them as a board from, from the chairman perspective or individual? Hey, what are you all doing so we'll know so we don't take this time and spin our wheels now? Well, it, they're here. They were, but they, they left, and, and that's actually how I found out. But anyway, I will let you know if I, I, I can tell you that I know that Will Robinson is familiar. Uh, he doesn't know any more than I do. I've tried, you know, that route. Um, so he's, he's trying to get the information too. And, and actually it was told to us um, or told to him by DEP. So I don't know the details. I have no idea. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Madam Chair, when you say Piney Point, are you referring to HRK or are you, okay. Uh, HRK. So then the other, you know, giant elephant in the room is the fact that HRK is in foreclosure and they have a hearing set in about two months. Yep. And likely they will no longer be the property owners of that, mm -hmm. of this, of these stacks. At the end, at conclusion of that, they owe $17 million, you know, payment which they have to, 60 days to come up with, and they haven't come up with, they've been making their payments in years. So uh, chances are they're not gonna come up with the 17 million. Um, a gentleman named Mark Strout owns the debt. Right, we know that. I, or I, well, I do, I don't know if everybody else. I, I've I been in, in communication with Mark. I tried to link him up with the administrator this week, um, but he's in Texas and mm -hmm. I heard they've been experiencing bad weather. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. rumor. They've been having a little issue. Right, so um, he, he was unable to, to make it here and, and we're really unable to, you know, organize his uh, participation in this workshop. Uh, but even if he were here, he's constrained by some legal issues where he doesn't actually control the property yet. He doesn't own the property yet. So he can't really make promises about the property yet. Um, but I can tell you that he is open to working with this board. He's open to a public private partnership and he is open to, um, us not just participating in the solution to cleaning the water, uh, but he is open to us being active participants on that property and possibly, you know, obviously likely gaining financially from the property from that point on once the environmental aspects have been resolved. Uh, so there is an opportunity with him, assuming he gets control of the property and we can bring him in here um, for this county to, you know, recoup some of our 
financial commitments that we're making here today. Uh, we have a sick, we have this issue of 60 day void that we're unable to communicate with him really, um, you know, during meetings where it's not really communicate, but he can't make commitments to us um, until that hearing has come, you know, come to a, a conclusion. Uh, but that's something that we all sort of need to keep in mind as well. Things could change in 60 days. Um, he is committed to, and it's what he does for a living. He comes into environmentally um, stressed and challenged properties and he rehabilitates them, cleans them up, and then obviously makes some money on the back end. He is a capitalist. I'm not going to pretend that, you know, he's running a, a not-for-profit organization here. Uh, but there is an opportunity. He wants to participate with us. Um, so that's something we should keep our minds open to as well. And there's an opportunity for us there with him, working with him to recoup some of the monies that we're putting in. To be honest, the $6 million is not um, the major issue with me. Um, the cost benefit to cleaning this up to me is, is exceeds the $6 million mark. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to sort of clear that up before we go any further. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Van Osterbridge. I've spoken with Mark as well. Um, he contacted me a couple of months ago. Um, and, and I think he really is genuinely interested in trying to work with all of us. And, and, you know, it's a matter of, at this point, it's very complicated because HRK is still uh, the owners of the property. And we don't know what's going to happen. And, and we can't make them do anything. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, I know that Representative Robinson wants to try and move ahead to try and get the financial allocation to help us, you know, be able to do something there. Um, and it is complicated <clears throat> because there was a grant out there that uh, I was really hoping that we might be able to try and, and get to help on the cost. And, and we couldn't because we don't own the property. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a tough situation. It really is. Well, and, and Mr. Strout is open to either option. He, and yes, he told he me He implied that. to me that he was open to following uh, the direction of the board on mm -hmm. this. Correct. So now that's that's a verbal conversation between he and I. That is not a commitment in a meeting. But... No, he told me the same thing, though. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner uh, Satcher and then Commissioner Servia. Um, I, I just want to say in general... I don't think this is all that complicated. Uh, we've got two options. We definitely need to take one or the other. That's it. There's seven people on this board. So the vote will be either four, three, five, three, six, or five, two, six, one, <laughs> seven, oh. It'll be there one way or the other. <laughs> There's going to be a vote one way or the other. Uh, information that would be incredibly important to us would be if the state speaks up and says we're only willing to back one option. We need to know that right away as soon as an administrator or anyone finds that out. But so far, that do, it seems to be we would prefer this, but we're not asking for an absolute uh, decision. Um, and then the same thing with the property owner, but like you say, we're in a 60-day purgatory with that. Uh, but the, the who in most in all likelihood would become the owner uh, in 60 days. I said both options are fine with him. So I disagree that we need, I, I feel like we have a, uh, a firm grasp or we should have a firm grasp and we all are uh, big boys and girls. We can go find any additional information that we need um, and ask for it from the players at hand. And uh, then we just make a vote uh, when the vote needs to happen. Um, so, and then that'll be that. I don't see why we would need to, uh, incessantly beat this uh, poor dead horse. So, and I want to say to the citizens of Manatee County, though, um, this board, I am still hopeful we're going to make a decision, not kick this can down the road. Um, we're going to get this done, take care of the pollution that is sitting there above all of our heads um, and threatening, you know, our water quality in the bay and on the beaches um, and inland. We're going to take care of that. This is going to be the board that makes a decision one way or the other, the best way to do that to the best of our ability, keeping your interest in mind, the safety of all the citizens of Manatee County. Thank you. Totally agree. Commissioner Servia. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Very good comments. So I just want to say, yes, you know, at the very high level, it is very simple, right? Let's do this or let's do that, but let's do something. The devil's in the details. And that's why it has taken us more than 18 years and we're still talking about this problem. So it is a very complicated issue. And I know that you all agree that we need to be very cautious stewards of our tax dollars. You know, um, 
everything we do is in the sunshine and that's how it should be. We're not discussing this behind closed doors. And you can bet that the current owner and the future owner are very interested in how many millions of dollars the county and the state are willing to help out on this problem. So we do need to be very cautious with every step we take because it's a lot of money and it's our citizens' money. Um, but I tend to agree with Commissioner Van Osterbridge too that there is a big benefit to spending some money to solve this problem once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cruz, then Commissioner Whitmore. Yeah, two quick things. Yeah, I, I understand we're supposed to be looking at all the options and figuring this out, but oh, we've been looking at this for 18 years. If you can show me one new piece of information, I'll personally fix this with my own money. Like, you're not finding any new information. Wait a minute, did y'all hear that? <laughs> it's, the, the I'd like to make, we, make a motion. We, we've analyzed this ad nauseum at this point in time. It's like, let's have six more work sessions on a depot. Let's have five more. None of us are scientists here. We're being asked to make an important decision. Both seem viable. Both of them have risk. Both have reward. It, we can have work sessions for the next 10 years and still say, well, maybe there's one more work session, and then we'll, we'll, un, we'll uncover the solution. We're not. We have the information. We need to make a decision and move forward. They both look like viable options. They both have risks associated with them. We're all intelligent people here who have been given all the same information. We need to make a decision and just move this thing forward. That's the only way we're going to stop kicking it down the road. And relying on whoever the next owner is, I mean, I, I wouldn't put the, the cart too far in front of the horse. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of foreclosures since I'm in commercial real estate on the finance side. Uh, a lot of foreclosures don't actually go through. There's a lot of ways of, of avoiding that. I, I wouldn't just immediately start talking to the, the note holder until we know. My understanding also is the note holder, I believe, has an interest in deep well injections. That's what he does for a living. So for, for anyone to say that, hey, maybe uh, <laughs> I'm open to both suggestions as long as the suggestion is a deep well. Um, <laughs> No, no, no. He, he, he also filters. He also filters water and cleans okay. water. He does both. I know. He does both. I, I'm. I'm just saying. You know. Let's 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 look at our options. Let's figure out which way we're going to go and make a decision from the board. We don't have a hundred percent decision making on this. There is an owner of the property. There's a DEP. There is the state. There's a lot of other players. But at least if we collectively as a board can say this is our decision as a board, then we can start moving this forward. Because I don't think we're ever going to get anywhere if we wait for for the, the smoking gun piece of information that's going to confirm to all seven of us that one way is definitely the better way. You're never gonna find that. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, and Commissioner Van Osterbridge gave me Mark's number before the election and I did speak to him. We had a phone conference and you're right. His business model is um, building deep wells. And if we decide or the state decides it's the best option, hey, I think he can do it a lot cheaper than a lot of people because he has a company that does that. Um, but again, my only commitment to the taxpayers and um, which I, you know, still kind of interesting with our budget issues um, that we're going to commit $6 million. That's my only commitment right now. I'm not going to do a long-term um, commitment on again, a private property, private business, a private disaster. But if we can get the immediate, emergency, you know, under control, then I'm going to leave the rest up to the private sector to do that owns that business. But yeah, he, um, he uh, told me that's his uh, deal that he does that in Texas everywhere. So I think he probably talked to most of us. So um, anyway, anyone else or can we move forward now? Uh, Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, I just want to discuss the elephant in the room. Is anybody paying attention to that noise? Is a bomb about to explode or anything like that? Can anybody give us a comment on that? <laughs> Property management's checking on it. They're going to have it cease during your meeting. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> or Brodsky. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to go ahead now with everyone's permission and move on to the CIP. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director Jan Brewer, Financial Management. Good morning, Commissioners, Chairwoman, Commissioners, Madam Attorney. Excuse me county attorney and madam administrator. I'm starting off well. It's been one of those days. <laughs> um, when we left here on Tuesday, we, my staff and I took to heart some of the things that were brought up during the session. And so what you have before you here today is a work session that we had 
scheduled and thought out before Tuesday. So with your permission, I'm gonna ask you the sections you'd like me to go over. But as I go through this, what we did is we went through and we said, here is your pot of money that we know of to help transportation. And I'm hoping this is the direction you wanted us to go, but I'd like you to walk through with me what I have. With the board's permission, the first part of this, if I can get it going. We were gonna talk about the CIP process and I'd like to do it on a really high level. If you'd like me to fast forward through that, I'm happy to do that too. I can give you an abbreviated version because I do think it is important that how these projects are brought forward, especially from public works, I think it's important to understand. Now, the thought process when we were going through the CIP is to how do you take care of a, of a very large watermelon, you eat it a bite at a time. So we started with the most important, which is transportation, which was your highest priority. So that's why we're focusing right now on transportation first. And then as we go through, we'll do parks and also public safety. So I wanna, I've given you a lot of list of existing cash flows. I'll go through that. And then we're gonna end with a, a list of known requests from Public Works that's coming before you for the next five year budget. Okay, so um, we were gonna go through and overall we have a capital improvement plan. The plan runs five years. You're only allowed to adopt a budget one year at a time, but this plan covers a five year zone. So the items in the outer years are not appropriated and set, but they're in a planning process to go through. Why do we have a capital improvement plan? It's, it's rooted in your chapter 163.3164 and it's capital improvement and it defines what it means. The, the shortened version is that for Manatee County, anything over $250,000 has to be placed inside this capital budget plan. Uh, let, me, let me just run forward because I think all of you um, this is probably the most important piece. How does a CIP project get added? How are they identified? How are they go through? Public Works goes through and identifies whether it's by capacity adding, um, items that are falling short, they need maintenance put back through. That is their priority as they go through and they're determining which roads to go. On top of that, you also have a lot of maintenance going on with um, aging infrastructure. Water and sewer lines are getting changed. That falls into place. So all of those key factors fall into place and in when they're establishing where they're going to be. Chad, did you want to add anything to that? For the point of brevity, not a ton, but the the just the two differences, that's the change of what we're doing. The primary purpose of the CIP development is to plan and build that fifth year, the next fifth year coming into the plan. Uh, but what we're experiencing is we, we still do that because if that's the major budgetary strain, but we're also putting out some fires here and there of where five years of record growth in a row have put us to have to add projects in years one and two. And those are extremely painful to deal with because you've kind of had your money, your spend plan uh, lined up. So we're definitely in that mix of we want everything tomorrow, but uh, traditionally what we're planning for is that next fifth year. Thank you. Do we have a plan and do we have a process? Um, we do have plans. We go through the utilities has a plan. We have a parks master plan. We have overall road plans. It's a de detailed work session that we're trying to plan out. As Chad just said though, priorities do come in between. Of this chart, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. So. Um, so that you understand the depth of the projects that have increased over time. If you look in the first chart in the far top left, this is um, conservation lands and natural resources. The red is the dollars and the blue are the number of projects. So you can see over time, it, it varies. It depends on what project they're doing and, and how it goes. Now, understanding that pattern that red is dollars, blue are projects, 
Then you have potable water, which you can see all of them are in upward moving. And then you have transportation on this far right top. The green dotted line is the IST. That's when it came in and that's when it, it almost doubled what we were doing. It, it added significance to where we were and the projects. And overall, the number of CIP projects per year, we, in 2017, before when the IST started, it was around 300 and now we're at 514. So what are the typical sources of revenue? And this is where we're gonna be focusing. For transportation specifically, impact fees, IST, gas taxes, property tax to some extent, and then other revenues for state monies and grants. Um, the source and stability, COVID did impact us this past year, but as you've heard me say, we're rebounding. It's doing very well. It's not the concern it was back in August of last year. So what are the phases? You have pre-CIP, which is what we're going through right now, CIP adoption. Once it gets adopted, you run through the design process. And then after that goes into permitting, right of way acquisition and design through construction. One of the things I wanted to make sure I said today is really it's a three-legged stool. If we're trying to expand the impact that you have in this community, you want to find out one, do you have the, the equity that you can go out and bond or borrow? The answer is yes. Your financial advisor told you that. The second leg is do I have the cash flow? And then the third leg is, can I get the projects through? So keeping those in mind as we go through. Wanted to make sure not only you, but also your constituents, especially, we have an automated dashboard that is on our website. You can click into any area of Manatee County, find the projects. You can actually isolate the projects by the type over on the far left. For example, if you wanted to know just what technology was going on, you can click on that and it will zoom in. It will also bring up a project sheet. It'll tell you everything you wanna know. So lots of times when your constituents are calling you, it's a really good tool to say it's online, you can see what's going on. And we actually merge that into the public works system as well. So it's automated now. So one of the things in, in 2024 plan, um, we added 54 projects. And what we've been looking at is the ability to make the projects go faster. And as you can see, um, some of the actions that, that we're trying to put in place is projects moving into design phase within 90 days of adoption, active management of the projects. Um, we have now gone, I know, I believe each of you have, um, have we've talked to you about it, but we actually have Power BI. Power BI is a use of data. We're able to take all the projects and put into a visual the stage where the projects are. Why that helps? Because if you see that most of your stages are in pre-design or design, then you can focus on those to push them down. You'd like to see about a third of everything in every stage. That way you know you're keeping moving and you're keeping things going. So with that, I'd like to go through the first part of what we're talking about with transportation. You have an existing CIP that is moving forward. Some of the money has been appropriated. Some of the money is planned to be appropriated. With that, we already know of changes to existing projects. This is the first part up here, which reaches 1.9 million. That's the amount we know without anything you've got to add. Public Works has brought forward new projects. Those new projects total 188 million. And we'll go through those in just a second because we, we need your input for prioritization of what you want to occur. But the overall issue is that we've got additional funding to go in. Now, originally when I did this, I was gonna walk you through the cash flow of everything. And I, I don't think um, that's really what you want. So I just wanna show you the highlights, okay? I'm gonna go through it real quick. And again, here's those three legs. The capacity to bond, if you don't have the cash, the cash flow to pay the debt, and then the timing of the projects to make sure you keep your tax exempt status. 
Again, we're going to focus on these types of um, partnerships. The public-private partnership, that's something that really isn't playing into here yet because those come before you, not us. We, we're not planning them yet, but th we just want to show you what's there. So how you read this, I'll just do it real briefly. So at three in the morning, you can look at it. But on the top part of the, the first bracket on the top, that's what's already planned into your CIP. That's the cash flow I know from gas taxes that will be occurring over the next five years, given that gas taxes stay steady. Now, there's a reason there's an uh, increase and a decrease. One of the things that was wonderful about the CARES Act, tra that transit received a very large grant that we were able to use operational expenses for that grant. That allowed us to shift gas taxes over here. So that's what we were doing. At the bottom, on each of these graphs, you're gonna see, I added three things, existing increases. There's two items Chad brought before you on the ninth. He wanted uh, Post Road and State Road 70, and then also widening a canal. So I'll, you'll see those come through. And then the bottom is the amount that we can plug in for gas tax over the next five years. So as I go through these next slide, the only place I want you to look is really the bottom. These are not cumulative. This is eight million, it goes up to here, you lose this, you come down and you're four million below where you need to be. So at the end of the day, the height of this over five years, you're down seven million. So as you go through this, I'll explain. For the gas taxes, you can see about seven million short at the height. If we go to the Northeast District, the Northeast District has impact fees that are stable right now and have availability to be expand. The 4.6, the 3.7, very positive over all those years. So any of the roads that come along that need additional funding in that district for growth, you have the availability to do it. The same in the Northwest very stable. And one thing I need to say with impact fees, they are not a guaranteed revenue. So we always place them at an average. You usually come in above. As soon as it comes in above, we bring it and then you can spend that. Southeast, Southeast with what um, Public Works is suggesting, you hit a $30 million snag in 24. And the Southwest is fine. They, they maintain, they have the ability, whatever needs placed in there, the growth factors are there. Infrastructure sales tax. Infrastructure sales tax over the next five years, you will, as we told you during the budget process last year, we're suggesting a $50 million credit line. Now, if you want, and we're gonna get into this, but the $50 million credit line is on a pay as you go basis. You get so much per year, you can pay it out and here you go. So overall requests, you're looking at 116 million that would need bonded. Um, we had, when we did this three weeks ago, we used 3% to be a little bit higher. Yesterday's rate's 1.55. You're, you're at low right now. So it can go anywhere between those, but those two ranges are pretty safe. So how do you play the shortfalls? The gas taxes, you're either gonna run from transportation trust or general fund, Southeast, you're gonna have to bond or whatever impact fees don't cover. But I wanna focus first on IST, which is the credit line. If I'm showing you the money, here is the long-term plan for the IST. The very first column is we are estimating 449 million of revenue will come in over the 15 years. We have reevaluated the revenue because they came in much stronger than when we came before you in the summer of last year. And that's because COVID was happening and everything was upside down. The next column is an approved list. You control the list of what you want there, but this is what was put before the public when they voted for it. So we've been going by this approved list. You'll notice every now and then we come before you, we're changing a scope, adding to it, decreasing it or either completing something off the list. This, the list is published on our website for everyone to see. So the balances remaining, I think are very important when you're looking at what you're gonna do. So two things from this graph that you need to pick up on, please. The 15 year balance remaining in transportation is 7.3 million. 
that 7.3 million that can go wherever you need it to go. They're in the different categories. Now you can see sidewalks right now. If we do everything we're gonna plan, we fall short. That's gonna have to be made up with either property tax or gas tax. But right now, and these are estimates, right now overall for all these categories 7.3 for transportation 9 million for public safety and 19 million remains for parks that can be allocated as you need in each of these categories now let me the second thing that was the first thing those are the balances after the list the second thing is that what have you got appropriated right now right now you have 20 percent of the total projects appropriated for transportation. How am I getting that? I'm taking the 64 million and I'm taking it out of the total list. So out of your total list, you only have 20% that you've actually got in the budget moving right now. You got a plan over the 15 years, but only 20% of the is moving right now. If you choose to bond and make all this happen at one time, I believe you, before COVID, infrastructure sales tax is a bondable revenue stream. I don't know if it, they're gonna let it be now, but you still bond on the non-ad valorem of the county. Same thing, you're gonna use the revenue stream to pay for it. It's just whether it is a bonding mechanism that you're just isolating infrastructure sales tax. What, so what I'm saying, if you want to move the roads, the remain the difference between the 310 and the 64, and then you can add in what nobody's allocated yet for the 7 million, you can go bond that and do it all right now. Again, those are two parts of that three-legged stool. The third one is, can we move 250 million through the process? That's another discussion. Public safety and parks. Um, parks is the largest. They've actually got 62% of the list done, but they have the largest amount, 19 million left over that can be applied and put on the list. In other words, you control the list. So if you wanna add things to the list, there's the pots of money where it goes. So if you don't mind for the viewers at home, I'm gonna say it one more time, just so I'm, I'm really clear. So right now in this column, the 15 year balance column, you have 7.3 million as a total left in the transportation category, 9.2 in the public safety category and 19.7 in the parks category that can be allocated to new projects. They're not determined, they have not been set. Again, you have the ability to go into the approved list and change that also if you if you so choose. What I'm offering also is saying, if you want to be an option, is if you would like to do all of the IST at one time, you can bond it. And it has to be over the life of the projects, but it's really gonna be over the life of the revenue stream is where we're really looking at. Okay, so that gives you a lot of options. I'm gonna stop right there. Has anybody got any questions on where it's at? I just want to ask about the, the bonding of the sales tax. Are you saying that's something that is in discussion right now to, to go away? Or is that just a guess? You had said prior to COVID, you could bond the future revenue stream of the, the IST, correct? Oh, but now you're it. saying post COVID, that may not be the case. Is that something in discussion or is that just a guess? A couple when, of um, when we were talking with, um, with our financial advisor and, and overall with bond council, we were talking about dedicated streams to repayment. IST has always been one you can dedicate, just as if you can dedicate tourist tax allocation. But when COVID hit, that was one of the taxes that faltered. You know, you, they weren't sure about it and there was a bit iffy. Right now, I can tell you that you came in extremely strong at the end of last year. You collected 105% of what we thought, I believe it was around 105 of what we thought. It was a substantial. So what I'm saying is, I do believe you can bond on that tax, but if the bonding authorities or the bonding gods that be say, we don't wanna do it on tax, it doesn't make a difference 
you can bond on the full non-ad valorem and you pay it with the infrastructure sales tax. So, so basically the difference Sorry. really is the AAA versus AA that we discussed on Tuesday because non-ad valorem, it looked like Moody's rated as AA if we bond based on general funds. But if we have a dedicated revenue stream, it was AAA on one of the tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, so there's two ways to bond. One is you have a general obligation debt. That's that ad valorem you're talking about. And the general obligation, you have to go out and have voter approval to dedicate that to it. So the other way to bond is to say, we're not looking at the ad valorem revenue. We're only going to look at the non-ad valorem revenue. And that's what we usually bond is the non, all the bonds we have right now are non-ad valorem. We have no general obligation bonds. Now, you did, the voters did approve for the conservation lands. That's where all this is coming up, the conservation land is the geo bond so that was a really good question so can i also answer yeah go ahead bill so um commissioner cruz i think the issue is whether the sales tax is still bankable from mm -hmm. an underwriting standpoint given the instability in that revenue stream it's not a legal restriction that might be coming on whether it's bondable it's just is it bankable yeah. anyone else or all right we'll move forward go okay. ahead jan thank you Okay, so here my crew and I went back and we sat and here is the question. And, and I think Commissioner Satcher asked really for it. You said, if somebody came to you and said, where do I get this money? What do I do? So I'm going through the steps that I would do for the money. So the first step I did is I went into your set aside reserves, right? Those are things that you've designated in certain funds that will occur for certain things. And that's in the reserves. That's not in the operating budget, but it's in the reserves. So let's start with the general fund. In your budget, there is a line item for the debt service of 1.5 million. That's a recurring. That's gonna happen every year. That's what I talk to each of you about. That is there. You will, it will show up every year and you'll be able to use it for debt service. The second suggestion I had is that you, the board, have a million dollars of contingency we place there every year. And over the last three years, you haven't used it. The last time you used it, I think it was for scaffolding, right, on the courthouse. There was an emergency, and we had to use it for that. If you cut that in half, that's 500000 every year that you could use toward debt service. The next one... Um, departmental shortfall. Since I've been here, that has been in the budget. They keep it down there as a recurring item instead of just sticking it in an operating expense somewhere. They use it down there. Well, in case of the department shortfall, I took it away. That'll show up every year. The last three, the state revenue sharing, the half cent, and that's the communication services tax. It's piddly, but I wanted to put it up there. Those are the ones we told you that we didn't those are revenues we got. We weren't sure we were gonna get them. So we stuck them down here in reserves and we said, we'll spend them on something when we realize those revenues are gonna come in. Well, we did. This year we moved them and we spent them, I believe on Lincoln Pool and something else, but every year they're gonna come in. You can use that every year as a revenue source. Now, going to transportation. Again, seven cents tax, that's for vehicles. We put that lower because the gas taxes we were worried were significantly lower. We use, they're used for vehicle replacement only. So we use ad valorem for vehicle replacement. We just switch it out and you can put, use the 544 for debt service from ad valorem. It's just the switch. Fuel expense, right of way and contracted shell. Nobody yell at me or throw a shoe. This, this one, it's in the past has been very passionate by the board that they wanted public works to have that so that they can use it. And Chad has used it every year, but we keep it down there until he comes forward before the board to say, I'm going to do this. But it is there if you wanted it and it's reoccurring. The unincorporated probably four years ago, they established a 500,000 board set aside in the unincorporated areas. So if you came up with an emergency beyond stabilization needs, this is something you wanted to fund, the board would have it. You've never used it. So if you're not using it, I gave it as an option. Total is 8.4 million. <coughs> 
you can see if you used a million five, you get 35 million for 30 years, 30 years because we're looking at transportation, right? Not anything else. It has to bond by the life. 3 million, 71 million. If you do 5 million a year, it's 119 million and 7 million is 166. Those are the bloom, gloom, doom. You know, you ask to do it in several different areas. Those are options. Those are options. I also put that um, I, I didn't go all the way up to 8.4 because I didn't know who was going to shoot me down on that one with the transportation. Totally your clue. I'm just showing you options. Okay. So having said that, are we good here? Does anybody have any questions? So this is, sorry. So this is above and beyond the IST money. This is just what we're yeah. already sitting on right now. Yes. So, so based on, I mean, that debt service, I know you're saying don't touch transportation. The 8.4, I, I calculate it's, it's 200.5 million worth of bondable at the full 8.4. I'm not saying we'd use it, but so you're saying effectively we could bond $200 million without even factoring in our IST. Correct. And and, and the debt service you're using is, is fully amortizing 30 year bonds up there. So for 30 we years. We could do that just with the money we have in our pocket. Today, with the money you have, right. And can, okay. so can I add just a little caveat? Okay. Because three years. Uh, what I'm saying is when, when, when Commissioner Satcher said, where would you go? This is the path we go. This, this is the path we go down. This is where we find our money. These are options based upon what you need. Now, here's the balance. Okay, yeah, well, there's a balance. Because in the general fund, the state revenue, the half cent, and the communication services tax, those also help you fund the sheriff, right? The sheriff hasn't showed up with his operating budget. And if, his op and if he comes in and says, hey, Neil, close your ears, I need $20 million. That's why he showed up. <laughs> no, no, no. Neil would never do that. But if it was $20 million and your ad valorem only went up seven, you have to look to these other revenues to make it balance. That's the balancing game. But if you, it's your priority. What, what are your, your greatest needs? And you don't have to make a decision today. This is to help you. This is transportation. That general fund pot of money is also what you'd look at with parks. Parks has its own money too. And as we go through the parks discussion, that will be different too. It's just, I wanted you to see if you ask me in set aside, in reserves, that's that first column on the, on Sheila, Sheila goes, you keep calling it a placemat, that the, the matrix she did, <laughs> this is in the set asides. So that's the first place I went. What are you setting aside? What can you use? And this is where I went first. Now, after this, where do you go? Then you go into the operational budget and you make decisions by level of service you want. What I don't know right now standing before you is all the departments are putting together their needs and what they've got to do. We'll get that and that comes before you and we will go through and see. We've already told we've met with every department director and we told them we're going to turn them upside down and shake out their pockets. You can't you can only ask for what you need. And they all are are very aware of that. So they're going to come back and I feel like you'll have some opportunities there. But I don't know what's going to happen with 22. That's that the sheriff, the constitutionals. I, I don't know some of these things. Jan, can I butt in just for a second? How yes, much more do you have in your presentation? Because it's 12 o'clock. That's what I'm asking. Um, if you'd like to stop now, I, I probably have okay. another 30 you minutes. Sure? Yes. All right. oh. Yeah. Let's Let's do ask that one thing since the, Wait. the slide's open. You Y'all want to continue asking? I just, I, we, we're we're working at the slide. It's more of a comment. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll say I love this slide. This slide's exactly what I uh, <laughs> what I hope for. This is exactly the way these slides should be. Uh, this is this is informative and it allows for real policy level discussion without the nuances and all the noise. I, I love it. Um, but just you know, the reason I, I I like this is not so much let's cut all of Chad's shell out. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's more for yeah, for, for hopefully shell. some comfort when we get to a discussion okay. because the IST piece alone covers <laughs> yeah. the entire CIP. Yes. Based on your other slide, yes, just our 15-year projected revenue on IST yes. exceeds our entire CIP plan at yes. this point. Now, so yes. what this shows isn't that let's take 8.4 million, bond it, and put 200 million dollars. It's saying we can do the bonding with the IST revenue projection, and if there's a dip like this year, which we didn't see anyway, it was 105 yes. percent. But if there's a dip 
we've got a backstop and a sizable backstop yes. that even at a three, $400 million bonding, yes. we can cover half of it just with money we've already got in our pocket. So it's a pretty decent drop in our IST revenue before we're at risk if we bond yes. this. That's what I like about yes. the slide. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, anybody else? Commissioner Bellamy? Yeah, I, I just think the, the, the importance of, of Jan, thank you. Did I show you the money? But you did. You, you, okay. I think you showed money. all of us the money. Okay. <laughs> thank you. My thank team you. tried really, we all tried thank really you, hard. You. And, to, and, and to your team and um, for you all's work. But I think we need to take this slide from a board perspective. And that's why our dialogue start as far as identifying where we're going to bond and what will our priorities be. And, and start moving forward with it. I mean, th that's what, to, to me, this last maybe 10 to 15 minutes has probably been the most productive part of in our workshops that we've had because now we see how we can move forward with the policy with some options in order for not taking nothing from anybody that's had any presentation. Please don't take that the wrong way because I know staff is always listening. Um, but when we're trying to come up with budget items and identify how we're going to make a difference in the county or in our particular districts, you just gave us um, probably about $200 million based on if we come to a conclusion as far as the board, as like my man Kevin just said, is that we have a, a, a lot of sidewalks we can clear out with this right here. So I can guarantee you from District 2, I know, right? <laughs> a lot more than sidewalks. <laughs> sidewalks, roads, there's a lot we can do. <laughs> and it, and right. it gets better oh, after wow. lunch. So it gets a little bit better. There's some actual... Uh, one time money and and we'll do that but we'll do that after lunch but thank you for those comments very very much commissioner van Ostermeer. yeah jan i'm going to echo a lot of what these two have said this slide is fantastic because i i really kind of drilled down on you on tuesday and and tried to tell you that this is the direction that we wanted to go and what i was looking for solutions based conversation uh and this is it and okay. so i just wanted to thank you very much i appreciate it this is what um you know this meeting today um you know, we started off a little rocky, but we got right through that, and then we got into Piney Point, and now we're on to things that I've been, you know, dialing up in my head for two years on the campaign trail, and uh, all the way, all the way to this point where we are today. And it, it took a long time to get here, um, but this is what I envisioned being a county commissioner. This is these are the meetings that I anticipated having. Um, so anyway, thank you for delivering. Thank you. Anybody else before we go to lunch? All right, we'll see you back here at one thirty. One o'clock. Oh man! Whatever you'd like to do, if you'd like to extend it to twelve forty-five, since you're a little behind, it's up to you, Madam Chairman. Twelve ten. We'll be back at one. 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 I got a few things I need to do. I can't come back.
What's on now? All right, we can get started. Okay. So just to recap before we where we left, um, I just want to recap what I just did because it kind of goes in line with the next three slides. So what you have in front of you, we this is recurring money. This is money we went in and looked at your set aside reserves. There's that aneurysm again. You're echoing, Seth. <laughs> So the most important with this slide is that it is recurring. It will show up every year, and this is money. If you choose to divert it, you would have an annual source to place this toward debt service, given everything staying the way it is today, everything. So the second thing we did is this is recurring money. So what about one time? So if we go into the chart that we gave you on Tuesday, one-time funding that you could access and realign, however, is the disaster fund and the stabilization and the general fund is 12.5. I want to stop right there because that six million that you're talking about for Piney Point, that would need to come from that stabilization. So you, you just have to balance what we're thinking with where it's at. I'm just showing you what I know. Transportation has stabilization of 1.9. The unincorporated after we brought in the funding that we're gonna bring before you in a BA to line everything up from the September 30th amounts is actually at 8.5. Participation projects, those are projects that Chad has done in the past. It's closed, any balances went into those. Those actually can be transferred back to transportation if you so choose. So the total there is 31.7, one-time money though. That, that's not gonna show up next year, that's it. Okay, the other alternative is an interfund loan. So I thought, okay, where else can you interfund that it would work? Two suggestions would be um, the beach erosion and also the Southwest TIFS has 20 million. If it's a short-term situation where you're gonna pay it back, then those are two alternatives. This isn't long-term, this is just a short-term, four to five years if that's what needs, but it would have to be paid back and there would have to be interest paid. Beyond that, the interfund loans, um, we're gonna have to get a really a legal opinion on the TIF, we'd have to get a legal opinion on impact fees, we'll have to get a legal opinion on anything if that's, if that's what you're chosen to do. But that would be an alternative. So if we put them all together, if you use the recurring money, um, although we showed you 8.4, I just used the five, that would get you 119 million, non-recurring one-time opportunities, 31.7, and interfund loans, if you did it, I mean, that's 176.9. Two things I wanted to bring up in everything that I've just said. If you move, if, if let me go back. Can I go back? So if you move, you so choose in this general fund, let's say you decided to do everything in the general fund and you're gonna use it toward transportation, move the millage from the general fund, reduce the millage in the general fund and just put it in transportation. Once you put it in transportation, just um, the reason I'm saying this, once you put it in there, it's restricted once it goes in. It has to be spent on transportation. Now, the only thing it does, it does limit you if you make changes and you wanna do anything, but that's an opportunity that between those, the only fund that has a dedicated millage by ordinance is the Children's Services Fund of 0.333 mills. This one? No, just what I said? Okay. Okay. So what I was saying is that when you get here, and I'm adding all this up, when I was showing you in the general fund, which is this slide, that there's debt service and that these, these are the items in your set aside, your ad valorem that's going in there creates this, along with all the other revenues in there. What I'm saying is if you want to move it to transportation to spend on debt service, you just move that exact amount of millage over to transportation. And once it goes into transportation, it stays in transportation. 
Yeah, on your trim, on your trim that notice. Park. I'm sorry, a dedicated line item? On the trim, yes. Okay. And we've done that with parks. Yeah, we did it. We were talking about other things we could do it in the future. Got it. Right. Okay. So going back to this slide, the only other thing is this last bullet point. I showed you a lot of unincorporated funding. Unincorporated may only be used on unincorporated. It cannot be used anywhere else. So it, you just have to define the roads where they're at. Oh. I, sorry, I was. I no, that's okay. I couldn't find my little thing here. Um, just a question about. I have one. I don't have one. The, the chair. Thank you. you can do whatever you want. No. Um, a question about the, the moving the millage, because I 100% agree. I think we should actually have more dedicated boxes. I've said this before. But if we move some of these general funds to transportation, basically make them effectively a dedicated debt service mm -hmm. source, make sure we, we're paying our debt service. Mm -hmm. If our real intent, or not necessarily our real intent, but if one of our options is to use the recurring IST mm -hmm. revenue, to actually pay for this. And this is more like, hey, look, we've got a pretty sizable backstop. If we move that to transportation, aren't we restricting the use of it to transportation? Yes. Now all of a sudden we're gonna have this yes. pool of IST and no CIP to do anything with it. And now we don't have our general funds anymore yes. because we moved it. Yeah, that's the warning. That's what I was okay. trying to get okay. at the okay. end. So I'll make yes. sure I'm on the same page. Right. Yeah. Yes. Madam Administrator, did you have something to add? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let, well, Jan's on this slide. If you look at the non-recurring one-time opportunity to use that number. Madam Chairman will remember, I think the other day she mentioned too, um, I'm just gonna use parks as an example. There's an amount of money in the parks that they need to pay back. Now you could look at, there's a list of a few of those other kinds of items which um, Director Brewer could provide. Those are kinds of things that have happened over the years that certain need to be paid back or smaller projects that are just one time. But um, that amount of money is an opportunity then for you to, uh, you know, allow in this example for the parks to that to be paid, that two million to be paid back and not impact the parks money down the road. So I just wanted to point that out as over time you start to see a, a list of one time opportunities. Thank you. And again, Mr. Satcher, oh, I'm sorry. did you have something you wanted to say? Um, the one thing I did want to remind everybody, in that non-recurring, I'm going to back up, um, that stabilization in the general fund, and that money is like for the $6 million for Piney Point. If you at, tell me I have to come up with that funding, that would be where I'm going, just so everybody's aware. And um, the one thing that all of this... I'm going and I'm looking at all your set aside reserves, but I'm leaving your operational reserves alone. That's the 20% until you tell me to pull that down. That's best practice. And I really would beg you to keep that. Yes, sir. And just to clarify, because I, I see what you're doing and, it, and it's great. That's exactly what we asked you to do. You're showing us the maximum pool and you're yes. showing the different stuff, yes. which is exactly what we asked you to do. It's awesome. But the reality is, before, you know, because there is stabilization money and the $6 million is a perfect example of why we have some excess cash. And the last thing we want to do is burn every penny we've got. The reality is from what we're talking about, the CIP as it's been laid out, which is a fairly inclusive document of virtually everything we can do in Manatee mm -hmm. County, uh, is in and of itself covered in its entirety in theory by the IST stream. And the recurring funding essentially covers more than sufficient mm. contingency and, and backstop on it. Right. So all this one-time stuff and interdepartment loans and, and disaster funds in real life is, isn't even really part of the discussion here because we would need to come up with new CIP stuff, even to get to a point of needing this. So this is just, you're showing us everything yes. and then walking it back saying, but we don't really need to do any of this because the IST and the backstop of recurring right. is more than sufficient, even if we handed... 50 engineers, a book that said, do everything. We would have the money without this stuff. Right, for okay. the IST, okay. yes, for what was on that list. Um, Madam Administrator? Yes, and just as a reminder too, um, as an example where we're at right now is about 
um, most of those IST projects were put into the list in 2015-16. And this year, we've got a 6% increase in our cost. You know, that's all related to e over each year. And that's factored in as each year we come back and bring the new budget to you. So there is, there always has been some issue about having a little bit of extra there so that we can cover any unusual cost increase or whether we were very low on a projection or a projection was old. Thank you. Misty. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. And a great discussion. And in, in the theoretical example that our CIP costs are covered by our IST, which is a really good thing to say to understand the money. We also have to remember that the voters voted for the IST tax based on a list of projects that they, they agreed to and the county agreed to. So I would say that we have to be very careful you know, if we decide to swap those out or change those, we just have to be aware that the voters were counting on that and there could be some challenges in changing that out. Carol. Uh, actually, it was 191 things on the list. I still remember we had scars on our back for that. But actually, that was uh, what was presented to the public was 191 projects. And we have deviated from it a couple times, but it had to go before that board to get approved. Um, within the spirit of what the voters wanted. So it's not like we can just spend it. It has to be, that's why you see it in different pots, public safety, et cetera, just so you know for history. And if I may, Madam Chair, um, when we leave here today, my staff and I are gonna email you some links, just some quick links that you can, you can actually go to for the IST, for everything <clears throat> else so that you can see. And we'll also email you the quick link to the map for the CIP so that you can clearly go in there too. Um, Jan, can I ask a question on that when you send the information? Mm -hmm. um, I know that some of the IST money um, has actually been moved, you know, to help one project get mm -hmm. started, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Will that also show yes. what's been moved yes. and so forth? Yes, because it shows everything that originally started uh -huh. and then where you are today. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions on it, because it, it is, it is a, a cumbersome thing, but just let us know. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore, um, I I think the one project you're talking about is the Animal Service Central Animal Services, and um, Charlie wasn't able to use that money. He, as you know, he's still got nine million in his reserves he hasn't used. So that moved quite a few years ago, three years ago, and that's when the public stepped up and um, agreed to contribute to a central animal shelter. So that is one thing that I recall, mm -hmm. and it was approved by the I. I was approved by the IST committee and brought to the board and voted on three years ago. And the IST, it, it's actually, you have the power. You, right. you have the power and the IST confirms that we're following your orders and that we're putting everything the way it should. One in, in the IST I showed you where sidewalks is a little bit under, we're gonna have to come back to the IST and say, this is how we're gonna fix this. We're just waiting a couple of years to see if anything gets better or if it gets worse or how it goes. But that's one of the things they're charged with, okay? Okay, so um, what we would like to do is offer to you, uh, Candy, you wanna hand those out? Um, our thought is now that you see what all the funding we have, Chad has made a list of the things he feels are worthy of suggestions, and that's what we're bringing to you. And what we were hoping you would do with this, on the very first page, um, you have, Sheila, actually. So on the very first page, you have the initial suggestions, and this references back to the number I used in the PowerPoint that I said, you know, we were trying to figure out how to fund them. Um, we've also given you behind that details of each one, the scope, what, what it is. And then on top of that, we would like you to come back and make your priorities or your suggestions or point us in the direction you want us to go. Thank you. And we wanted to provide you with everything. So while you have this document, which is all the new stuff, and it's all stapled together with explanations for each project, we are also provided you what's in the existing CIP. So the existing C 
CIP, um, we printed it out and we'll send it to you in your link. This is a shortcut version. We took it out of our CIP system. Everything has rolled over. So now you have 22 to 26. We have not added anything to it. This is just as what's there. And transport, and we also made you a summary. So here's a shortcut on existing projects. There's the project where you find the project and the project summary. And then we gave you a jump drive with every project we have. If you, if you have a project that's existing that you have a question on or a scope on, mm -hmm. you can easily look in this page, this um, index that is alphabetized and you're able to find it in the detail and on the high level. I know it's a lot of paper, but I'm trying to get you where you can get the answers that you need. Our biggest hope is that we have a very good discussion on these initial new or where you would like things changed. Chad, did you wanna say anything or? When appropriate. You can go ahead. <laughs> when appropriate at the end of the day. I'd say Chad's now. Under the, he's under the radar. For well, while, Chad, while Chad gets his thoughts together, we'll just say <laughs> um, collectively that um, you've just received a lot of information, yes. mm -hmm. but this is to walk you to the next step. And these are this is, you know, following what you all have brought forward um, in the last couple months or so to us is you want to get deeper into this. And now you're getting a copy of all of the projects there, there's going to be an opportunity for you if you need to, because there's absolutely no reason why we would think at this meeting here today that you'd start digging into these lists and asking questions, but all the staff are available. They're going to follow up with you on to offer a briefing to go back over or answer any questions or point you in the right direction. Because remember, um, Director Brewer showed you back a ways that there's a um, comprehensive online dashboard that has every project that we currently have in the CIP in it, that you can actually use that, go in, find it, get the same information. Citizens can do that. But this is getting you to the next level. And when I, I'm going to hand this off to Chad by saying, we went and we asked Chad from the transportation spec perspective, we asked him as his expertise level, his staffing expertise and the role he plays, what are the projects that you think based on what you've heard the board talk about, what citizens have talked about, what the life of a project is, projects that need to be upgraded. What is the list if you had everything in your power right now to give a list? And so that's what he's done. And I'll turn it back over to him. So the first thing, this kind of has a fallback to the earlier slide. What does it take to get a project into the CIP? So typically what our team does within Public Works is it's an annual process. So over the course of the year, we're observing what are, uh, what we're sensing, seeing. Sometimes it's more clear than others what priorities of the board really are. Uh, we see and hear the concerns and comments from the uh, former CAC and 311 Center, what the complaints are. We drive the community. We Most of us live here and work here. So we know where a lot of the congestion is. Uh, we have the data from the Traffic Management Center uh, almost in reverse as far as the uh, a ways idea. We know where the uh, congestion is at rush hours and things. So, and we know where the development has been, is going and where it will be. So, I mean, there's a, a little bit of an art trying to say with the limited money that's there, uh, maybe in what order or what's coming and be pressing. Uh, we're being much more aggressive recently in dealing with individual intersection projects recently in the last three years y'all uh, the board has been generous and funded uh, i forgot the exact number but it's in excess of 10 new uh, traffic signals over the last three years that have come through uh, the process getting out ahead of things before they're dire emergencies and saying they're an emerging emerging need uh, where by the time this development happens uh, it will meet warrants and things like that are coming uh, also baked into this list are numerous maintenance responsibilities that compete for certain kinds of money. So it, it looks like a, all the money that is in this proposed list is certain things are, you're maintaining existing things. They're redoing, reconstructing an existing road that's uh, at end of life. Resurfacing won't do it. It needs a full base repair. 
uh, replacing a bridge that is at an end of life. They're not in danger of falling in, but you're in that 70 year plus, 60 year, 70 plus, and a lot of the bridges are all roughly, uh, I forgot the exact number, I should have studied that today, but we have probably 70% of our bridges 1960 or older, that 60 range is where the most common date and everything's aging. And they're all what we call functionally obsolete. So they're just wide enough for the two lanes of cars that go by and they make it impossible to get wider lanes, to get bike lanes, to deal with sidewalks, pedestrian improvements, any road improvement, it would cause the bridge to be a bottleneck. So uh, not to have say a tidal wave of all the bridges be in that emergency case. Uh, we've tried to uh, introduce one to two each year within the program to uh, make that a much easier thing. Plus uh, replacing a bridge uh, when it's your choice to replace a bridge is much cheaper than doing it under an emergency situation. Uh, you can plan and do your uh, maintenance of traffic a lot better, uh, even though some of them are quite painful, but at least you can advertise and, and deal with it occasionally. So uh, those are the three categories of the main things that are in here. So the reconstructing of a, a number of roads, uh, the examples are on here. I mean, there's some on 9th Street East, Lockwood, University Parkway, uh, chunks of Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, chunk of Lorraine. I mean, these are when we say they hit the CIP is because individually as a project with the resurfacing budget being $4.2 million that the cost of those individual things would put too big of a, uh, uh, a hurt that I was looking for a better word, but too big of a hurt on the resurfacing budget. And it would just change what you normally accomplish during there. So we present those as annual investments for additional gas tax uh, maintenance. And then the uh, the four true capacity, I'm seeing five, I marked it, that are true capacity adding projects that are in this list are 63rd Avenue. Uh, there's a chunk here of Erie Road, roughly halfway down. I'm going down the list in order, uh, proposing the connection of the missing link of Lena Road, uh, completing uh, Lorraine Road, and the last one that's a pure capacity job is Upper Manatee River Road, the north south section that's on that list. So there are five capacity jobs within that list. Is your button on? Hey, Vanessa, your button? Your button mic's not on. Can you tell me anything that's like, for the, I'll tell you what I'm asking about is Lakewood Ranch Boulevard and Balmoral. Coming. Know that's supposed to be this year. So Correct. That's why I was yeah. asking it, this year. Coming and moving absolutely <laughs> as fast as we can. I expect it to be bid late summer. Okay. All right. That Construction. Is so track. at the moment, you'd get me dangerous. I don't know if I can promise by Christmas or not, but it is absolutely coming along as fast as it can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, we're talking about moving a lot of these projects up and stuff, and I know you had hired not too long ago engineers. Realistically, all these projects that we're moving up, and I and you need, I think you need to be honest with us whether you can deliver, uh, you know, the engineering, the plan, uh, the designs, and um, usually have to be thirty percent before they get funded, correct? And so there's know, a and the funding. That was a beautiful <laughs> lead-in. If I if you if you want to come back to to something I had forgotten to say in my overview, it, it's in my notes. It's one of the things that we wanted to say the the misnomer that we have traditionally done to ourselves when we have put CIP projects together up to as recently as just three years ago, we would, when a project would roll in, you would see in the, in the budget, a lot of times you would just see a design uh, cost and then a construction cost. And they would almost be, most of the time, be back to back in years. So that would pile us in uh, with a lot of money appropriated in the CIP with the inability to actually get it out and bid. Many times the design took longer than a year, add in land acquisition for the time, and that means I'm sitting on the construction money for two years. So uh, I, I do have a pretty good sized bank. As we're showing these new projects proposed in there, we're definitely allocating separate timelines on the design track, design and permitting track, the land acquisition track, and the construction, trying to be a little, a bit more realistic. Uh, past history, everybody's well aware, Manatee County has been a very conservative county, and it's put you in the financial situation that you're at, in the sense of we don't design things until we're fully committed to fund it for construction. So 
there are no magic projects sitting on the shelf that are designed just waiting for construction money. We have traditionally, and, and this is, I don't know how to say it any better, but traditionally not been, even Joy mentioned it Tuesday, not been a big user of eminent domain. That does put us in an interesting position sometimes when we're negotiating, trying to, we've done all the easy projects is where I'm getting at, and they all, all the projects need land. So we can get in this endless negotiating loop with projects. So our systems are sized for the pace and the way things were. So we've staffed up to a deal with more projects. We're not quite there. Uh, the, the, Public Works reorganization with the uh, uh, changeover of the county engineer it gave me some capacity. We're still in the process of hiring some project managers there. But within that uh, was the immediate recognition of expectation. We've initiated with purchasing the redoing of our continuing engineering contracts that are our firms that we can go to and just issue designs for projects under $4 million. Uh, we need more. And there's a couple we need to replace uh, as far as from a performance point of view. So that will expand our abilities. What I'm saying is we're laying the groundwork to get more stuff through uh, on a capacity side. Our processes on land have been limited because we're doing a whole lot more with a whole lot less. Bill doesn't have any more uh, uh, attorneys to help process everything. And uh, by going to a I need to give you a confirmed schedule on when the projects are going to go through. We're fixing to implement with the next projects as they come through. The land acquisition process it needs to kick off at an appropriate time during the design process when it can, and we give an end date. We're not saying I want this land taken by eminent domain. I'm not, I'm just saying we need to have the land in our hands and under our control by this date. By boxing that, my anticipation is a whole lot more probably will end up in an eminent domain situation to do that. But I haven't even had a chance to, uh, with all the transition going on, confirm all those conversations with Bill. I apologize, Bill. I've sent you a couple emails, but I mean, that's what we're prepping to do. I mean, we feel the community's desire to move faster. We feel your desire to see things move faster and that allows us to at least commit because unfortunately sometimes when we hit the end of the design uh, you hear me say I'm still in land acquisition and it, it goes on for a, a very long time. Uh, to finish that once we're in the CIP we brought this up the other day I forgot we've been meeting so much but um, when it's when it's in the CIP book and certain stages you go ahead and start and um, some of these projects are like in process with lots of money being spent. And that's why we plan five years. If we don't, uh, if we stop it, we're gonna lose all that money and whatever's in the process. So if you hear stuff up here that you, that we don't know about that are in the, the hopper that are at a certain process, you know, it's gonna be a waste of money. This is uh, whatever's in the CIP has been vote, voted on five years ago. Um, and then we've added some as it is. It's a five-year plan. So kind of like the MPO has their plan. So we just got to make sure that, uh, and Chad, I know uh, maybe it was somebody the other day that more or less said that, that, you know, I'm, it was Clark, I think. Once you get at a certain point, you know, if we stop, we're going to lose a lot of money. It gets more difficult. Certainly things in motion definitely will cost you money if you make changes at that point in time, whether it's just changing the project or deleting the project. There literally is wasted uh, points of view. If it's shifting, changing gears with a project that hasn't physically started, but say is in the third year coming out, it, you start dealing with some public perception issues because of trying to count on the program. I, I was waiting patiently and my project's coming and now it may not. So uh, there's those are those difficult situations that you all are put in with uh, never being able to make everyone happy. Yeah, that key or this one. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, very good discussion and you brought up some of the important things that I was gonna bring up, that realistic timeline. You know, uh, Chad, I'm guessing that our project management team has that software, project management software, where you, I don't know which program we use, 
but where you can get drill down pretty detailed into the development of a project and and know the timeline and it's pretty easy then to stick to it what do we use do you know our program we had just implemented in the year before uh, uh, the pandemic is called eBuilder and uh, honestly it was a lifesaver for us because it allowed that uh, that team to work remotely mm -hmm. seamlessly from kind of the, uh, the beginning. Uh, we're in the process of implementing that program in phases. Schedule is the one that we're working on right now and then allows that level of detail uh, throughout the early design process to keep our critical path moments lined up. Right, and, that, and it, that's just what it does, right? So um, I, I love this discussion and I think that um, we're seeing all the pieces of the puzzle and how we can put them together. Um, you know, yes, we wanna use more of our money to build more infrastructure. We know now what's available and where we can take it from. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'd love to organize a round table that includes some of those triple P partners that may be willing to partner with us and say, you know, hey, here's our bucket of projects. Who wants to do what? How long would it take? That kind of discussion, because that also allows us to understand how much money are we going to spend and how much do we want to move. Um, and then I know uh, you talked about land acquisition, and that was something on my list is that, you know, I, land acquisition is tricky because you don't want to buy stuff that you end up not needing it for a roadway for 25 years or something. If you think you're going to build it, though, if if we before the it's in the CIP before it's in the five year program that everybody's looking at, you know, if we can start conservatively um, uh, acquiring some land before it's out there on the hot list, uh, because then it's going to be less expensive. Right. And I understand also what you're saying. We may have to result on more eminent domain to do so. But I think we can still keep the friendlier approach and, and work through those issues. But the price is going to be substantially lower if we do that. But in balance with that, we have to be very careful that we don't buy things that we're not going to end up using. And as the board changes and as we have new people, I mean, that's the dynamic, too, that we don't know about. Right. So, you know, this board may want something and then the board may change in a couple of years and say, we don't want to do that. So anyway, great job. Great job, you guys. Thank you. But I've never been called what Kevin and um, <laughs> I've never been called. I've never been called it. I, I, I'm looking at. I'm looking at this. Just, and um, I just want to know the the, the the timing, right? And I may be off, but the timing as you go through these different phases, like planning, design, construction. Um, can you just like a, a, a no project is average or typical because every project is different and it has its own variable variables for a formula of success. I understand that. But when we start looking at these different levels and different areas right here, how does that timing go? Like from planning to design, is that a, is that six to nine months or is that five years or? I think in terms of, think in terms of some of the wor uh, worst situation where I, I, I don't have my thoughts organized as well as I should. When I mention I can use my continuing contracts on jobs that are $4 million or less. There's a state statute that if it's excessive $4 million, my designer has to be selected via a standalone separate RFP process. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, competitive process, but it's also wonderfully uh, formal and can run into its minimum of three months, typically runs into closer to the four or six month process, just to get to the point where you've selected your designer to move on. That goes for any public works uh, type project. So whether that be roadway or a standalone uh, utility job. Hence, initially on our Ninth Avenue project, we had done a, a, a planning level work assignment just to deal with our initial stuff, but the RFP to actually design it had been done concurrently at the tail end of that process to try to speed that up. What I'm saying is if you have the major jobs that roll into the CIP, that initial first six months is kind of like you're in planning where we're validating the scope and releasing the RFP. Uh, traditionally, we don't do a lot of that ahead of the October one when a budget actually exists, uh, even though we haven't encumbered the money. So, I mean, there's 
systems and policies and procedures that can get tweaked to try to jumpstart some of those things. But that's again, that conservative uh, approach. So to answer your question, let me circle back. I didn't ignore it was minimum for anything of a good size minimum in that 12 month process on a design. Typically your bigger jobs, you're in that 18 to uh, 24 month uh, to deal with it. You've got a long lead time uh, via surveys, uh, and that's just getting your base data to bring it in before you can start your serious work. And then the process that Scott reminded me of uh, back in the cheap seats was at construction or during the design, we still have a lot of utility coordination. And we, when we use the word utilities, a lot of times we talk about our water and sewer because we move them around a lot, but it's all the other utilities that we're working with. So maybe we've did it or we designed it and yay, we started. So there's a component during the construction. Why does things take so long? You have to wait for uh, Tico to move a gas line. You have to wait for uh, FPL to get their power lines relocated and you just can't do nothing until that stuff gets done. So there's those additional things that get coordinated. So on the big projects, a minimum of 12 months, more practically in that 18 to 24 month land, we're trying to say we want to improve uh, what our expectations are. We've been our own worst enemies and recently of trying to uh, make everything friendly. Uh, we've probably tried too hard retrospect looking back not to go to eminent domain. Um, We've, so uh, I think within that standpoint of that 18 to 24 month, give me an extra six months on the land and then you roll into construction. And then I'm sorry, the construction is just based on whatever the size of the job is. So us uh, sidewalk jobs, cut it by, you're in that six to nine month on the design because you still need that base survey. That's a major lead time. Uh, Sidewalks, sometimes if you're piping ditches, you still have uh, uh, permitting that we need to go through. So it sounds like gross overkill, but there still are steps that have to, we have to go through. All right, so I basically came up with, you know, depends on the money. If it's less than $4 million, $4 million you, we go faster you can because go, we can go straight go to a, a designer. Bit faster and, um, based on the state statute. Um, obviously, the size of project permitting go in the first, you know, probably in the first six months. That's sometimes that's a hang up. Am, am, I, am I correct? And then, and then it depends on what are the entities that we have to collaborate with, whether or not it's the water people or whether or not it's the Florida power. That's, like, that's what makes each project unique because some are very easy and some are right. building through an orange grove like a developer sometimes does is a bit easier than building 26th Street West or something. It, <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Uh, given where your heads are at right now, as I'm looking around the room, um, be good for me to throw in as you're listening to Chad. You're talking about transportation here. You just brought up engineers. Do you have enough project managers and engineers? And then you talked about P3. And I think it, it's important for me to say uh, a combination thereof of these variety of ways to add all of these projects on would be smart to look at because when you add all of these projects on, the good question, do we have enough engineers? Do we have enough project managers? Do we have enough this, that? It's not just in the transportation department, it's in procurement. All those, anything that we're gonna do that has to go to bid, you're gonna be adding extra projects there. You don't wanna delay. So I think it's, it's really good if you keep mindful that there are other elements of the county government that impact this process, depending upon how much money you put in that part. If you're gonna to try to do P3, obviously that helps a lot, getting things out and not adding to things. But I'd use a word like ramp up. If you wanted to ramp up in the certain areas where you need these kinds of people ready to go when the projects get to them, and then at some point you would be possibly ramping down. So just keeping that in mind, because we don't want to not deliver to you what you want to get in the timeframes that you need to get them. Mm -hmm. um, on your screen, we provided this to you because we thought it would be useful. These are divided into the same um, categories as IST, which is the, the sidewalks, the roads, and then also the intersection. And it shows you where the current projects are. 
And so for instance, Sheila, could you scroll down on this one just a little? Most of your projects are in planning or design and the construction is very few. So that, that's what we're trying to say with, you know, everything we're doing is that you wanna make sure you're looking at what all we have on our plate right now. Um, the other thing I failed to mention, if I may, just for a minute, is that when we're presenting all this, one of the things I really encourage you to do, um, we were talking about a credit line with IST, if you do a pay as you go, I would also recommend you do a credit line when you're in the design phases for some of these projects or right when you go to construction. It worked out very, very well for us with 44th Avenue. We were able to you know, convince the clerk we have, we did our due diligence, we've got the funding, but we didn't have to pull it down until we needed it. So I, I just wanna throw that out there that that's an option too. And I'd add to Jan real quick about, you know, the metrics of these three categories in planning, in design and in construction. We grabbed a whole, we, we got, took a hold of this um, somewhere about October 1st and said, we need to get more projects in design and out of design and in construction. And so when you hear us talk about, Chad talking about e-builder, he can see his projects there. But when you hear Jan and the other departments talking about Power BI, we actually can see each one of these projects and where they're at in these particular categories. If they're at 30% design, 60% design. So these are the kind of metrics that we've been building for you so that when we need to be able to say we can make improvements and where can we make them, you'll start to be able to see these projects move quicker. Thank you. And one of the more critical things is just finding what you want, what, what the board's prerogative is, what, what they want to do, and then us coming back with solutions with that. Uh, eminent domain, for the first few years I was here, um, it, was, it came before us and people were very upset about it, and that was before 44th. Uh, well, we had talked about it. We didn't really get going, though. Um, and I voted against it quite a bit. I'm so into property rights and I, I hate it when government tries to take somebody's property and they don't want to. And then, um, and so what you're seeing is all the prices we're paying when we're doing 44th because for $5 million for five acres, I could go anywhere, you know, with the King property. But I did like the customers friendly better than just saying government, big government's gonna come and take your property. And when we do, we still have to pay for it, but there's some people live in their house for 50 years and they don't wanna leave. I mean, there's some in Parish that I know that we've actually had to go around their house because they won't do it. So I don't know what the direction of the board is, but my, um, my thoughts are still to be more customer friendly because I don't see as many come before us that we've had to do major, major settling. That's all. Commissioner Serbia and then Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Yes, thank you. And I'm glad that um, Jan said, we just wanna know what you want because I am looking at this list, Chad, and I think that we need to add a few things. And this is the initial new suggestion of Where projects. So, and Chad and I have talked about this. So um, we have 63rd Avenue East on there from 301 to Tuttle. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we need to take that all the way to Lockwood Ridge. We've talked about that. Is that the portion where we have right-of-way constraints? That last, that's, uh, you're between Barrington Ridge and uh, the Cascades. It's basically, oh, so we're cool. covering it through through Tuttle being the 39th. So it's technically four lanes on that short block between uh, Lockwood back to. Oh, it is. That, okay. Yeah, so we that completes the link for to get you to Lockwood Ridge. It just sounds different because we say total instead of Lockwood. Okay, got it, got it. And then I know the US 41 um, project, we talked about this at the MPO. It's been put on in a holding pattern because of a utility issue that the county's trying to work through before the DOT can get it back on the program. But as you know, you know that is a major safety issue. We've got to do those complete streets and sidewalk improvements along US 41 because that's where most of the pedestrians and bicyclists are being killed. So can you tell us an update of that utility project? Do you know? Since, because all that, uh, all that discussion took place since in January. And that was the lead in, I will get to that. Okay. So this is our list. That is how I said, this is our observation of the past year, uh, but we've only had you by the time our list were due to turn in to prep for this annual process, roughly at the end of Christmas, early January. So we only had a few weeks of looking at you. So that's why Jan is definitely saying, I'm saying we wanna say what I'm sure we missed 
some of these priorities because some of them you may like, some of them you may not, but we're, we're there. So because that discussion about US-41 took place after our list was submitted, it's not shown on there. We had made a commitment in coordination with DOT. Uh, they will uh, continue and finish. We're gonna come up and essentially front the project via cooperation between ourselves. Uh, the TIF program, I believe, is gonna deal with the DOT side of the cost. Utilities had a relook at their CIP and they can come up with the money. So as fast as everything can get laid in order, the project will be able to be made forward. That'll be one of our ads, as you see, by the time we bring the formal list that is submitted, that's a project I expect to see hit this list is because uh, it needs to hit our list if, for us to spend money. It just came up after we published this list. And, and something we haven't talked about before is the intersection of Whitfield and US 301. And east of US 301, you know, as you, if you're heading southbound on US 301 and you're taking a left onto Whitfield, that intersection there is, uh, you have to merge very quickly and then it goes into a two lane road. And it is a little bit uh, jammed up because of the truck traffic that you get there. I don't know if there's a concurrency problem or if there's any other problems you guys are aware of, but as somebody that drives it all the time, it, it does seem to need some improvement. And as somebody who drives it from Lockwood Ridge to 301 on Whitfield in the morning, because of the uh, industrial development that you have along that portion of Whitfield, you have a lot of trucks on that segment of roadway at the same time that people are trying to get to work and it backs up. They can't get in the driveways fast enough. They're queuing out on Whitfield. And so, you know, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I haven't talked to you about it before, but if we can begin thinking about solutions to that. Uh, definitely something to think about. I was trying to, uh, we have an active design effort coming for a section of Whitfield under an IST project, which is usually, uh, is making the road better, but I think it's on the west side of 301 and not the east side of 301, but the scope might be able to deal with that one block uh, if, if we feel it'd be appropriate. I uh, just need to look into it more. I would have to agree with Misty Servia though on 41. That's pretty important. That, that created a, a real ruckus with the uh, MPO. Um, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. So am I hearing it correctly? Now is the time to present our grocery list to Chad? If, Evidently. If I may, Go I ahead. think what we can do, um, we were hoping, and you let me know if this is okay with you, we were hoping that you would take this list and we put you a column in for priority. And if you wanna add and make something else a number one priority, please let us know. Well, of course I wanna add. <laughs> <laughs> There's hardly anything from my district on this grocery list. I mean, well, we got nine. <laughs> can I ask a question out of curiosity? I don't. I I didn't come here prepared today. Right, I didn't to either. Add to this, so we're just going to take our time, look at the list, yes. add because I know there might even be some things on here that yes are not priority for this board. So I'm not saying there is, but I mean it could be. Sure. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I just that's exactly what you just said. I, I didn't come prepared. I, yeah. Though listen, I have my list in my head. I memorized my grocery list. Don't worry about that. But <laughs> but I was just making seeing if this is the appropriate time to, to present it. Thank you. And if I may, our hope was that you'd take this home, think about it, you know, ponder it, and then Chad and I'll be around to visit with each of you. And then we can kind of work through there. All right. Well, we can ponder. I like that word. <laughs> Commissioner I'm sorry, Satcher. That's a, that's yeah. a Southern word. Yeah. Sorry. So, so maybe I don't confuse things. Uh, recently, if you've been sitting here watching Vita uh, schedule messages or schedule messages, schedule meetings with my, me and my staff. I mean, my purpose on that staff is to talk about the existing CIP and make sure everybody understands what's in it, what's underway, what schedules and, uh, things are with it so not to confuse it with this step additional step that's greatly important too yeah Commissioner Satcher yeah I like where we end, ended on that um, or where we ended up there in that you know the purpose that I was told on this workshop was we were going to be talking about you know finding mm -hmm. you know funding and what type of uh, funds we could find as opposed to the grocery list as Commissioner Van Austin Bridge called it um, not that that is uh, not in my head as well. Um, but, and then also I think that uh, as uh, 
uh, Madam Chair Boss mentioned, looking through and being sure that these still align with the way our county and our uh, areas are growing uh, and the needs of the people that we're hearing. So that I think that is definitely worth um, looking at. I wanted to back uh, probably way up uh, in the presentation. Um, so we've been talking about, you know, different sources that we have in the CIP. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you did mention um, that the sheriff will be, you know, making his request as far as funding, um, which, uh, you know, I have said a million times on the campaign trail that I'm for fully funding the, the sheriff. So, um, and, uh, and don't have any plans on doing, any, you know, on, on a backing off of that. Um, so beyond that, um, as far as, so we have our revenue that comes in as the county. Uh, we have the projects and the budget, full budget that we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. um, we have what, you know, basically immediately goes out to the sheriff to fund him. Um, and then I think I heard you mention constitutional officers. Mm -hmm. officers. Can you go through that as far as sure. what portion of their budget comes from us and what portion does not? Sure. When I, when I brought it up, Sheila, can you go back on that slide to where it was general fund and we were just talking about the recurring. So what I was referring to is when you get your ad valorem in and when you get your recurring revenue in, that's what you match your expenses with. And um, we tried to match them and where I was finding money was in set aside reserves that we said, well, we could have put this in operations, but we put it down here in reserves, but you're going to get that money every year. What happens in the normal budget process is you go through and you figure out um, the needs of everyone. The sheriff will come to you um, with, with his needs in a letter. The constitutional officers that you support will come to you in a letter. Um, the tax collector you won't get a letter from. That's done by statutes, 3%. We calculate that for you. They all come. They say, here are our, our wish list. And then the departments come before you and say, here's our wish list and where we're at. And what you do, the ad valorem is the offsetting factor. So you assess the millage based upon what you need. Now, what's happened in the past is that around June 1st, the property appraiser comes over and he says the valuations for everything are X. So we put that into that calculation. And if the desires are not the desires, but if the total expenses that the constitutionals and everybody wants, you're trying to balance and live within that millage plus your other revenues. And that's, that's why now if the values go up, your, mil, your millage stays the same, but some of the taxes go up because you're basing it off property values. You do a X, so how you do it is um, a $250,000 home, you just divide it and you times it by the millage and that's what they pay. So what I'm trying to say is you still have that operational section to go through to just, I just wanted you to be aware of it. I wasn't saying anything by it, just right. saying, hey, it's there. So, but even, so even as we're looking at the budget now, and then we're talking about uh, the most uh, unencumbered, the most free uh, money. And then we've also talked about the ability to bond, but even beyond that, I mean, we have, uh, we have other constitutional officers um, that we will be in charge of their budget, correct? They'll come, they're in charge of their budgets, but that you fund the budget. We fund the budget yes. and we get to make a choice in that. So if we decided, you know, to uh, change, no, I, I, no. I better, I better asking. stop right there. Yeah, I, I, that's the question I'm asking. <laughs> I thought I made so it obvious. What the I was constitutional asking. officers by statute um, derive their budget and what they need to exist. And they come before you and say, this is what we need to fund. It's always in Manatee County been a very good relationship between the constitutional officers and the board. That they work together to make sure they, they both get where they need to be. So, okay, so they've always worked together. But as far as the statute regarding that, um, I mean, th there's, not a, there's not one, correct? Yeah, the statute says you have to fund it, but there are mechanisms if you disagree, but we've never done that. We've, we've always been able to work real well with them. But so you're saying, though, that there that there that is an option as far as to change our budget as far as how much we would even have to bond if we wanted to fund projects would be and i'm i'm drawing the sheriff's not a part of this conversation okay um 
But right. beyond that, right? Beyond that, uh, we do have. It's not forced upon us to approve a budget that comes before us. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's right. That's right. That we deliver a budget to you, given all the factors that, given all this discussion that you're having today, and you've had already in prior prior meetings that you have leading up to meetings, and the other elements that Jan mentioned, which are departments moving forward, what they have to have for their base and continuation for your level of service, and then any consideration for additional things based on level of service or other factors. You've heard from Chad, these are some transportation projects. Then you'll hear from, you know, there's other departments. And then the constitutionals send forth their budget request to Jan. We sit down and as your county administrator, we go through that. I reach out to them. Um, we, if there are more requests than what is um, covered, under the funds that they're allotted um, through the statutes or the various fines or fees, there may be good reason to recommend to you that you we look to fund something additional for them, or there may be, it looks like this is a good idea to leave it here. But all of that comes forward then to you in a budget that's delivered to you around the 1st of June, mm -hmm. including the sheriff's budget. And in the past two years, what I've tried to do, and we've been successful is, when the sheriff submits his budget and we go through it together, he and I go back and forth, we talk about the request, and then we've been able to agree on a recommendation to bring forward to the board. Now, that doesn't mean you have to accept that because you'll get to see everything they did ask for and the sheriff had and all the other constitutional still come before you. They come on a meeting day and they present their request. And then as um, the financial management department and our office move through your summer of budget meetings and into the fall, then you end up making your final decision based on all of these factors. Commissioner Van Alstenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to clear up the, you know, sort of get the history right to Mr. Satcher's comments. Um, it has not always been a, a rosy relationship between the constitutionals and this county. Uh, it famously, uh, Sheriff Stubbe and Ed Hunsinger had you know ruthless battles over budgetary you know disputes. Um, so it, it's not necessarily a rubber stamp. You're correct. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. yeah. I can you. say, um, in the last five or six years, it, it's been a much better relationship. Mr. Van Osterbridge is right, um, but it has been really, really a pleasure to work with Mr. Wells, especially he's, he's really done, he's worked with us very well. Commissioner Whitmore. And the times you're talking about is in the recession and um, we didn't lay off anybody in the constitutionals, I don't think but we did lay off, you know, 300 in ours. Uh, but what you will see, and every year that I've been here, um, in the last few years, I think the sheriff comes to the county administrator with a list of about 12 or 14 officers or positions that he wants. Then they look at the budgets and because it's a reoccurring cost. It's not just a one-time thing. Then we uh, use impact fees to pay for their capital, their, their cars, whatever they need to do their job. And usually they come up with a happy medium. Every time I've talked to um, Sheriff Wells, he has worked with Ed and Sherry at, went before Ed left, and they worked it out together. Can I finish? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm just looking forward to speaking. <laughs> we, we understand. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I get that impression right, you're going to attack me. I'm take a deep breath. Just I think mic. you need to take a deep I'm breath. Good. I'm good. I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, well, we yeah, saw you got that one. Up high for me to see it. I'm but it, in all due respect, I've talked to the um, Sheriff Wells, and he has been very happy. And if he wasn't, he would come and tell us that. But he knows our financial constraints. Other ways you can do it, if you want to fund the sheriff 100%, you can raise taxes. That's always a deal. But this board hasn't raised the millage since 2009, and I don't think we intend to. Yeah, huh? You can always, and uh, yeah, you can. These are recurring. These are recurring expenses. So you can say that now, but then you've got to cut forever. So yeah, if you want to lay off people, stuff like that, you know, that's up to um, the board. The county administrator submits their budget, and then it's up to us to do. That's how the statute reads. The county administrator presents the budget, however they feel it is, and then it's up to us to vote it or cut it or whatever we want to do. 
that's what the statute says. Am I wrong? No, that that's Thank correct. Thank you. Excellent civics lesson. I, I would have well, to add though some to people that, don't that, know that. I tell you, I can remember every single year uh, the budget was a battle between Ed and the sheriff, yeah. between Sheriff Stubbe. Yeah. I mean, it was war. It was. it was horrible. It was the worst. I hated the budget more than anything, only because I knew that uh, th they just could not see eye to eye. Commissioner Satcher. But we did get a budget. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess... I thought I communicated clearly. Um, the reason why I brought this up was not to even suggest or even a moment in a little bit of a way that we cut back on the sheriff's budget. In fact, I'm going to be every, I'm going to be a huge of increasing the sheriff's budget, taking care of him, backing the blue, taking care of our deputies. Not only that, but I'm looking forward to a respectful conversation when he comes. And uh, I witnessed a conversation that embarrassed me when I was a private citizen, when the sheriff came before a former board. And he, to me, was treated completely wrong. And it went deep in, I mean, I remember it. I remember watching it. And I remember that I could not believe that what, you know, what are essentially public servants and let's be honest, politicians were talking down to the sheriff who's putting his life on the road, on the line and his deputies that are on the road stopping cars and they don't know what's going to happen once they get up to the car. And yet they were talking down to him. And uh, so it blew my mind, but it also gave me motivation as I went forward. Uh, that might have played a part in me being here today. Um, so I don't have any intentions of cutting uh, the sheriff or his uh, employment or his budget. Um, I actually was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about the clerk of courts is who was in my mind uh, with that office and how, you know, the, the size of the budget there, if that might be an option so that we could cut down on bonding and taking from other projects going forward. So that's who I was not planning on saying what I had in the back of my mind, but at that point, I'll just go ahead and say, I was thinking about the clerk, um, you know, and uh, the office is there, not that, uh, you know, wish anyone ill or anything, but I wonder if, uh, if maybe that budget could be tightened. Just a question might be worth addressing um, as we go forward. Thank you. I can actually vouch for what Commissioner Satcher just said. I recall that myself. Commissioner Servia. Yes, uh, yes, we all love the sheriff. I love the sheriff. We all love the sheriff. The sheriff is great. Law enforcement's great. Um, we also have other constitutional officers that are very important too. We have the property appraiser. We have the tax collector, Mike Bennett, who handles our elections. And and do we fund the clerk's budget, Madam Administrator, entirely? Not partially. entirely. Partially, right? Partially. Yeah, partially. Seriously, she's holding that microphone. And, um, and very, very important um, what they do too. So yeah, they... They all serve us uh, in a very important way. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think what Commissioner Satcher was talking about, Ms. Misty, I don't believe you were on the board at the time. But anyway, anybody else? Commissioner yeah, Whitmore? I, I sure do. I, I was figured. on the board. And um, we're all adults here. These uh, constitutionals are duly elected, and they have important roles in this county. And to be saying right now that you're going to cut constitutional's budget i'm sure well uh, it was just said that maybe we can look for monies there and we do control some of the budget never heard of that since i've been here we haven't cut any constitutional's budget even since the recession what we didn't do at one one maybe one year is not add any more positions in the sheriff but after that he was the only one for a couple of years that actually got positions added while we laid off 300 and we are only a hundred higher than we were in 2009. So to think we're wasting money, uh, you know, but the clerk of the court to say that, uh, I don't know enough about the clerk of the court to, um, to say that they're wasting money or not. Uh, Angel is a duly elected constitutional officer and I've never, ever, ever heard a complaint about them wasting money or having too much or too little. So this is the first I've ever heard of it. For the record, I wasn't talking about the clerk of the court. I was talking about the sheriff's office. 
uh, with the county administrator at the time. Um, I don't have anybody else on the, any other Madam comments. Madam Chair, I do have a forward. comment. I did a search. Um, maybe you had an issue and maybe you could have had an idea to, to do what you needed to, but since you've been in office, you've only voted against the budget twice. Correct. So um, obviously those other years, you must have been okay with it or you wouldn't have voted for it. Uh, and I remember voting against it because of the sheriff's office. So. Jan, go ahead. Yes, if I may, um, we're at the close of where we needed to get. Um, what I wanted to ask you, though, did I get you where you needed to be with the CIP did, for today? Is, that, is everyone okay, or would you like me to do anything further? Okay, hearing none. Oh, you're not allowed to talk. What? It, <laughs> the only thing that I would add while you're while you do that contemplating thing, or if you wanted to add things that helps me in clarity, because we, trust me, we, we're engineers, we dream up stuff that you might be able to build at any time. But uh, if you run out of specific projects that you do, I mean, help me with the priorities. Or, I mean, what, what we call to say is, uh, what are your buckets, I mean, for your policy? I mean, it's capacity driven improvements, absolutely the only thing you're worried about. Is it sidewalks, the, the absolute toppest things? intersections is safety uh any any sort of noun adjective that helps us uh i've got five i can think of but i can't think of any more but aim in this bucket that would be very helpful for us yes <laughs> all of the above agreed and and we did fully intend for you to rank them <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we collectively put the seven scores together and we bring it back to you mm -hmm. for discussion. That's not a ranking down to whatever you want, but we really do want you to rank all these. Um, at large commissioners, you know, can help rank any of them, you know, where they need to be, but um, I think it's the intention that we bring them back to you as in the seven scores for each one, and then you have more discussion to break it down even further. So the next meeting we have on a work session, I believe, is March 16th in the afternoon. Right. Um, we'll be talking about parks. We'll bring back the same presentation with parks. Just please keep in mind when you go home and you're going through all these things that we've talked about today, it's just those those recurring money in general fund. Those will be pulling against parks, too. They'll be pulling against transportation. Mm -hmm. Just, just remember that as we're going through it. But I hope we gave you a lot to think about and we'll be coming around to visit and answer any questions you have there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Jan, just one quick note. Really, this probably isn't for you. It's probably, I, I know Charlie, I think, is in the other room. But the master plan mm -hmm. for parks, mm -hmm. I don't know that coming. I've ever actually really been able to see it. I don't believe it ever it. came before. It's coming, no. though. It's so, on your schedule. Okay. Yes, and in the master planning work sessions, you're going to get it in advance, and um, I believe that's the May, I believe it's the May date, but you're going to get it well in advance. Yeah, so I you need can it talk before about May, it. please. Yeah. If yeah, you don't he's, mind. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's Anything all I else? have. That's all right, all have. Uh, commissioners. Any comments before we go to public comment? I can't believe it. Okay. All right. I'm going to open public comment. I don't know that there's anyone from the public that wants that's here. But you know, maybe Zach would have something. Um, go ahead. Well, wait a minute. I got it. Do we have anybody on the phone? Yes, Madam Chair. Oh, we have two. Please go ahead. 605. 605. Please press star six to unmute. And so you know this is in reference only to what has just been discussed this, the CIP. Yes, yes. ma'am. Andrew go Griffin, ahead. Manatee County. So I, I've been listening, you know, I was working today, so intermittently. I was listening to the first, uh, but I've heard this whole entire um, segment. And so I'm hearing how we can budget for the CIP. But what I am not hearing are the things that we are pulling from the CIP. So, like, I'm seeing almost $11 million being spent on GT Bray when we don't have sidewalks in Parish for kids to walk to school. I'm seeing a $10 million animal shelter here. Um, that is no longer needed now that we have Bishop. We are expanding two of the newer libraries in this town, which I do not agree with. Um, Chairman, are we let's see here, we're spending, she we're has spending the almost a million dollars on LED, LED lighting for GT Bray. Uh, beaches and waterways getting $46 million. 
let's just keep going. I, I got them all flagged here. Um, we're spending $37 million on criminal justice and public safety and expanding juvenile detentions in our court manatee facility. Yet I don't hear any programs we're putting together to prevent people from even making it there, um, which is a little alarming to me, seeing how we've been expanding our um, our uh, jails and other um, juvenile stuff for many years. I see $32 million being spent on watershed basin studies. I mean, there's, there's just, there's a lot of stuff in here that's got to go. And it needs to, the fat needs to be trimmed out of the CIP. We're talking about raising tax. I'm hearing this whole time, and it's infuriating me that I'm hearing that we're raising, that we're considering raising taxes to pay for the CIP that's filled with a bunch of pet projects, in my opinion. Um, Mr. Cruz was discussing in our last meeting about, you know, looking out 30, maybe 40 years on our needs and building based upon that, which was a very, very smart, smart, smart idea. Because when I lived down on 64, I ever, I lived there for 10 years. And 64 was expanded twice in that 10 years. And I thought that was a, a, a total waste of money. Um, so, and then I'm hearing that we, we have financial constraints. I don't understand why we're putting all these things in these specific buckets and forcing ourselves to buy these things, whether we need them or not. And then if we don't, we don't spend the money, it just sits there until we find something to spend it on instead of returning it back to the people. Um, I hear comments all the time that we're all adults here, and the one person saying that is the most unprofessional, childish person on this panel that can't control herself to keep her mouth shut when um, the chair is speaking. Um, I've seen Vanessa go out of her way to try to be polite and courteous, um, but Carol, you do not run that board. And so that's my Andra, comment. you need to finish up, please. That's it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller. The next caller is four four five four four five. Please press star six. Can you hear me now? Oh yes. Okay, Glenn Jimlin. For the record, I just want to state uh, with uh, with Mr. Statute that I am behind the sheriff's budget one hundred and ten percent. He does an outstanding job, and for the new commissioners, if they haven't been out there yet, you should take a tour of that facility. They've got aquaponics. They got welding. 6,000 chickens, hogs, they're pretty self-sufficient. And if I were to guess that we had to go out and buy that food for Cisco on what we're growing out there, it would be in the millions. And he has that option to do it. He chooses not to. So I can't say enough about Sheriff Wells and, and the tight ship he runs out there and the, the vast amount of monies that he saves the taxpayer. So I'm on board with uh, James, and I think everybody, all the board members are on with the sheriff's budget. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, parks and recreations. We spend a lot of money. Um, the only thing that I would ask in the future, you know, lo and behold, you guys don't see the finished product till it gets on the budget or or gets to or on the agenda. Well, that's that's way too late as far as I'm concerned. Why don't why don't we allow citizens that are concerned about the budget to sit in the preliminary uh, negotiations of what we need to spend at break. You know, all that is done in house in their private little silos, unseen and uh, no citizen input whatsoever. By the time it gets to you, they've got all the things they want and there's very little discussion. I think we need more citizen input on all of that. And lastly, I will tell you all these trust funds, and I'm going to bring up FPL again and ESCO. Uh, financed by a health trust fund. It's unacceptable. I think all those trust funds need to be reviewed under scrutiny of, of, a, of a citizen citizen oversight committee. And I will tell you that they cannot spend money what uh, on trust funds. They weren't even smart enough to take it out of the general fund. They had to rob it from the health health trust fund. It's unacceptable. And and believe me, there's going to be dues that are going to have to be paid on that. So you guys are doing a great job. I don't think there's enough citizen input on all the projects that are being financed. And I think uh, there should be more transparency. And, you know, if you got a meeting at three in the afternoon and we're going to discuss $15 million of TT grade, open it up to the public. What's there to hide? We might have better input than your own staff. 
It's by the way, it's our money. Thank you so much. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm Pam Freeney, Chair of Animal Network Shelter Manatee Capital Campaign, and I hadn't planned on speaking today, even after Ms. Griffin made a conclusion that I'm not sure I agree with. But when Chair Ba shook her head yes to Ms. Griffin's conclusion that the shelter is not needed, I felt like I had to speak up even though I understand it's out of turn relative to the date of the appropriate meeting. Thank you. It's been 667 days since you voted to fund the new county animal shelter east of I-75. From 2010 to 2020, Manatee counties added approximately 85,000 residents. Of the 18 zip codes in our county, those growing the fastest are all east of downtown except for Holmes Beach. The other high growth zips are mostly east of I-75. Manatee has 28 fire stations, seven in the east, 47 public skill schools, three built in 2019 east of I-75, including the new middle school in Lakewood Ranch. We have six libraries and the new East County Library is under construction. The 44th East Avenue extension into Lakewood Ranch was estimated at 162 million recently and it's also progressing. This shows the commissioners understand the need to provide services where the people are. Providing all of these services east of I-75 though begs the question as to why there's no plan for an animal shelter to be located in the east where the people are. I heard at first it was because we didn't need a new shelter, replace our old one. Now I'm hearing that it's because Bishop Rescue on 59th Street West was recently offered to the county. With Bishop, we could be on the brink of adding another me measure of sophistication to county services that will not be equaled by anyone else in the region. But as generous as this beautiful facility is, we cannot abandon the East County shelter just as we can't abandon the East County fire stations, library, roads, or schools. That is where the people are. Manatee County is 743 square miles of land and easily it is 50 miles from the tip of Anna Maria to the East County line past the old Edgeville area. It's unbelievable that anyone can think a single facility located in West Bradenton, nearly 35 miles from this county line is acceptable. A pet owner would have to drive 35 miles one way from the East County line to West Bradenton to relinquish or adopt a pet. And in many cases, it's not gonna happen. Why should it have to be this way? Money's in the budget for all kinds of projects, yet one that was agreed to nearly two years ago is being considered as unreasonable. Having two major animal sheltering facilities spread across Manatee County might cure decades of neglect at the current facility, might make up for millions of dollars that are being rushed into East County for roads, fire stations, and libraries that may not be needed exactly in the near future against the shelter that is needed immediately. The Bishop gift is going to take months of legal considerations before you vote on it. If you do not agree to fund the East County shelter in this budget and you vote against accepting Bishop later, we'll be back to where we were two years ago with a broken shelter and without a plan. Almost finished. Thank you. I'm seeing a bias. I don't understand it. Uh, we hold managing the animals as a sacred trust, and you may not understand our unwavering dedication to the pets in need, but that doesn't mean it's not real. It's critically important to thousands of us. Please move forward with the shelter manatee. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to address the meeting coming up on the 23rd. Um, we are, you know, we've addressed, we've instructed the county attorney or directed the county attorney to negotiate with Mr. Hines. Uh, I've only had one opportunity to meet with him for about 30 minutes. Um, I have another meeting set up with him for Monday morning for about an hour. So I hope to learn more about him then. The process worries me. Um, I'm worried that we've put all of our eggs in one basket. We don't know as everyone's meeting with Hines, how, you know, everyone's opinion is shaping up around that singular person. We sort of, like I said, eggs in one basket, left ourselves with one option. Um, I've obviously been promoting and advocating for Dr. Hopes. Uh, I did email everybody his resume today. I hope that everyone has, you know, met with him and giving him an opportunity as well. I know Commissioner Satcher was talking about Rick Mills 
and I also know that Dominic DeMaio has been reaching out to, I assume everybody has certainly been reaching out to me. Um, so there are a few people out there other than uh, Mr. Hines, but the, the process, I just, I, I lack of a social life, so I think about this stuff at home and at night, right? Um, so, but the process bothers me. Um, I go back to at a recent meeting when I talked about how we have um, county administrator, deputy administrators, and all department heads, and how there's not a single African American in the bunch. And what I said is that I feel like we're, it's clear that we're not affording an opportunity to all. And now here we have this process where we're appointing an acting administrator and we're not affording an opportunity to all. It's sort of right back where we were. And I understand there are time constraints, mm -hmm. but I think we should consider maybe a consensus here and talking to the county attorney and, and offering him up a consensus and advertising, be it for 24 hours, but advertising the position because Commissioner Satcher brought up the idea of each of us, you know, putting forward a name. And the, at first, I, I sort of debunked that, but the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, he, he's he is right. I see where he's going with that. And he's going with that is we're pushing one person and driving that one name, sort of regardless of putting all of our eggs again in one basket. Um, so I'm I'm just pitching the idea of uh, advertising it, be it for 24 hours, but advertising it so that people, you know, especially local people who have interest in the job, we don't know who might step forward. We don't know their qualifications. Could it be someone we all know and trust uh, that steps forward. Uh, but I don't think that we're affording an opportunity for all. And it, it sort of goes back to what I was saying a couple meetings ago. Uh, and here I, I catch myself caught up in, in exactly that type of a process that doesn't afford an opportunity to all. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, you could stop all this stuff by just not um, terminating her next week. I spoke to her yesterday and I said, I can't believe, you know, I'm getting these calls too. And I've told everybody I don't want to talk to them until after the 23rd. If you're going to terminate or not renew her contract, whatever you do, fire for or coordinating a meeting with me and Commissioner Cruz, where six other commissioners in the history that I am aware of have had the same exact meeting. Of course, there were male administrators. And I'm the first female administrator that ever asked to have this done and the first female, I mean, commissioner and the first female administrator. So, um, you know, I talked to her, I said, would you even stay here? And she said, well, of course, I love this county. So um, I know who you support. Um, they're all reaching out to me left and right. I've told everybody I wouldn't talk to them. I do talk to Scott because of all the wacko stuff that's been happening here lately. And he's in the medical world like me. So I have nothing against Scott, but I am not going to pick a friend. You know, I'm going to give a friend the same opportunity that I will everybody else. If you guys decide to terminate her next week or agree on the um, termination or, or the agreement that she's going to bring before us, then I would go do a national search and I would do Charles because I don't know Charles any more than when working with him for eight years, nine years now. But he is a, if you all met him, he's a very even keeled gentleman. Uh, the people that some of you guys are talking about, uh, very controversial in this county in certain roles, whether it was their fault or not. Um, Mr. Is it DeMaio? DeMaio? What's his last, uh, Dom in Lakewood Ranch, DeMeo? This, his name was brought up to us when we were considering Sherry by someone in town that called all of us and told us to um, vote for this person and five of us didn't. And I told him, um, he sent me a text wanting to meet with me. I said, this is nothing personal, but I wanna wait till after the 23rd. So if you guys are still gonna proceed with this termination agreement or this settlement agreement that she's going to present us next week, then I want to do a national search and I will support Heinz for now. And I've told the only one I've really spoken to is Scott. So he knows where right. I'm coming from. Okay. And you know, Scott controversial, he, he did win a general election, you know, nonpartisan. <laughs> so he has been approved by voters. That's hard. Oh, to deny. I know that, but he's also on the school board now and there's been so much controversy um, and we've gotten a lot of emails and it's not Scott. Scott's helped straighten it out, but I don't think it's appropriate for us to choose a friend right now until we uh, take a step back and see what's out there. I agree with George, if you're gonna not keep Sherry, that we need to do a national search. Uh, Mr. Hines is a very professional, um, 
qualified man, and I um, will support him. Uh, Mr. Clegg, would you like to comment, please? I would. Thank you. Commissioners, you're in a work session. You're oh, not noticed to take action today. We're not. Yeah. These are decisions that have significant legal implications. The potential for litigation is there, and it's very real. So I have to advise you that you can talk today and share your thoughts, but until you're in a noticed meeting, which is next Tuesday, you cannot give direction to me or anyone else on how this needs to be handled. Because if you do, you could create a very significant due process issue. So you can talk about it if you like, but I have to be honest with you, until you're in a meeting where you can take action, the board has to make decisions by majority vote for them to be legally defensible. And the only way you can do that is in a properly noticed public meeting. And I would just like to add that I really don't think it's it's appropriate uh, for our county administrator right now to have to sit here and listen uh, to some of the things that are being said. I don't think that's very appropriate. Madam Administrator, I know you and I have talked about this in the past. And Anyone else have anything to add? Any comments? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Bellamy. The green light. The green my, light. Mic, my mic wasn't on. <laughs> I, will, I will take heed um, to the county attorney's um, recommendation, but I will tell, I will ask each commissioner that voted not or a vote to um, get rid of the county administrator. Today we had a forgiving heart. I'll see you all Tuesday. Anyone else before we adjourn this workshop? Workshop adjourned. Thank you.